Michelle Hughes um, and Rochelle Silver aren't able to be here. Also, Tasha Hager was called out on a CERT call, so she won't be able to be here. And we have two people participating via live stream. That's V. Riviere and um, Maria Medina. Okay. We also have a new member, uh, PPB representative, Officer Carl Clunt, who's joining us tonight for the first time. So, all right, so I'm gonna hand it over. We have our professional facilitator again tonight, Maria Elena Campestigi, and she'll get the meeting started for us and we'll get into our presentation. Great. Thank you, good evening everyone. So once again, I'm a, I'm a facilitator. I'm, I don't work for the city of Portland and I don't work for any other public agency. So my role tonight is just to be a moderator um, and just to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly and that all voices are heard, both on the co-ab as well as um, our uh, community members here. So it's my second, um, time facilitating a co-op meeting. Um, it was apparent by the last meeting that there's tremendous commitment and passion and collective care about the issue of police reform. And it's my privilege to be here um, as also as someone that lives and loves the city. Um, so tonight, this is about a report from the CACO about the, um, the work that's been done so far and the important work that's left to do. As with every co-op meeting, we're gonna begin with the purpose of co-op and then and the expected conduct for our meeting. Um, so the purpose of the Community Oversight Advisory Board um, is the orderly consideration of the public's business as it relates to the settlement agreement between the City of Portland and the U.S. Department of Justice. Preservation of order and decorum is necessary for due consideration of matters before the co-op. The public is welcome to attend co-op meetings, and during the co-op meeting, there's gonna be time-limited opportunities for public comment. Um, public testimony on an agenda item should address the matter that's being considered, and other options for later testimony are emails or snail mail. So when you're testifying, um, you, you're gonna be coming up here, um, um, you're gonna get two minutes, and if you can keep an eye on me, I'll just kind of give you a, a respectful, you want three minutes? Okay, three minutes then. I've got my timer right here. Thank you, sir. Um, you will get three minutes. If you can keep an eye on me, I'll give you a respectful tap just to give you a heads up that your time's coming up. Um, so please respect that time limit, and, um, and then that way we have everyone that wishes to speak the opportunity to do so. Um, Co-op rules of procedure seek to preserve the public order to ensure that the co-op's deliberations proceed efficiently and that those who want to contribute have the opportunity to be heard. Behavior that disrupts the meeting from its purpose by interrupting either testimony or deliberations is not allowed. You may show support or displeasure with your hands. You can wave, you can thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, just ask that you be respectful. Um, we don't have um, a place, uh, a, a designated place for filming, um, but we just again ask that you be respectful and uh, not distract uh, from filming. So this is a warning that, and is that a thumbs up again? Um, this is a warning that everyone, uh, anyone disrupting this proceeding may be escorted from the co-op meeting and excluded from the remainder of that meeting. So the co-op also uses guidelines for maintaining common ground. These were approved on September 10th, 2015. Um, they are as follows, that the co-op members have agreed that they will abide by these ground rules they will critique ideas and not people. Um, they will work towards shared understanding, speak from personal experience without generalizing, using I statements, speak to all with the utmost respect, avoid crosstalk, listen respectfully when others are speaking, listen actively and attentively and seek to understand, share the air, refrain from monopolizing discussions and encourage participation by everyone. Challenge ideas in a respectful manner, avoid put downs, even humorous ones, or other attacks on individuals. Ask for clarification when unsure or confused. Exit meetings in a way that is non-disruptive to the group dynamic. Recognize the legitimacy of people's feelings and support co-op members in expressing their feelings in ways appropriate to the setting. Hold one another accountable to keep agenda items and focus. Support the chair in managing meetings. Turn cell phones off 
or to vibrate and make no calls or texts during meetings except in case of an emergency. During meetings, use laptops only for meeting business and use the parking lot. Um, actually, I'm going to call it the bike lot. Um, the bike lot tonight will be held by Mandy. Um, so if there's thoughts and ideas that are not relevant to the current con uh, conversation, we will go ahead and capture those there. So at this point, um, I would like to introduce the COCAL team who will be presenting updates since the last compliance assessment, as well as providing an overview of, of where this work is headed. Um, we've got Dr. Amy Watson, who's chairing our meeting today, um, Dr. Dennis Rosenbaum, and Dr. Tom Kristoff. So um, we'd love for this to be an interactive meeting that allows time for COAB members to ask clarifying questions. Um, so uh, COCAL presenters, if after specific items, you can kind of pause. And there's a lot of information here. So if you can pause, we'll give time for clarifying questions and then you can continue. Um, we will have time for community members, um, an extended period of time. In addition to your three minutes, we will start with clarifying questions just to make sure that um, all the information that's been presented is clear. So Dr. Rosenbaum, I'm passing the floor to you. Thank you, appreciate it, welcome. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is a town hall meeting um, as required by the settlement agreement and uh, the situation is such that the compliance officer and community liaison or the COCOL for short uh, shares information with the community at large uh, regarding our compliance assessment and uh, the COAB is here as well to uh, hear uh, any comments from the community and, or feedback from the community and participate in this dialogue. Um, uh, given that we have a new uh, semi-annual reporting cycle, this is an off-cycle meeting, if you will, between two of our main reports. Uh, but we have collected a great deal of information since our last report, and so there will be a lot of new information presented, and that information will also appear, um, you can expect it in our next uh, set of reports, both our compliance report and our outcome report, which uh, will be coming up in a couple months. Um, if we can go to the second slide here, um, whoever's, okay, perfect. Um, these are the topics that we're going to cover uh, this evening. Um, we selected these because uh, they're important to the success of the reforms in our opinion and they're also connected to the settlement agreement. They cover some core sections of the settlement agreement. So uh, Dr. Christoph will begin, and then Dr. Watson, and then I will, and we'll each take portions of this, and, and we'll, uh, as you said, we'll, t we'll stop, and if we don't, please interrupt us and make sure that we do, and, and, and get the input from everybody as we go along, rather than have a, a discussion section at the end. Um, uh, okay, good, so we're gonna start by talking about the force audit, and Dr. Christoph, Tom is gonna go ahead and begin to introduce that to us. Yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, so we, we've covered the force audit a bit in previous reports. Um, the force audit is a response to paragraph 74, 75, and 77, um, looking at whether uh, force reports are completed comprehensively, looking at uh, the 940 process and the chain of command review. So it's a way to, oh, I'm sorry, the 940 are the after action reports that the supervisor reviews of force incidents. Um, so there, there's been some new developments that we wanted to keep you updated on. Uh, one of the things is a audit findings report. Um, so when the force audit has, it, when it finds deficiencies in uh, the different force reports or the different 940s, um, a, a audit uh, findings report is given to the supervisors and they have to provide a response to what the deficiencies were. Um, there's also been implementation of increased corrective action for de uh, repeat deficiency. So as, as the process continues, if the, if the deficiencies continue to occur, there will be increasing uh, corrective action. Um, there's also plans for response and action audits, um, that is looking at the audit findings report, looking at the audit response form, and making sure that what is on those forms actually have occurred. Um, this is resource dependent. It's something that will be coming down the line, though. Um, 
And there's also this effort to make data collection more efficient. Uh, when, when this began, I believe that there were approximately 300 variables that were being collected to look at, uh, to, to do the force audit. Um, there's a question of whether those can be kind of reduced to make it more efficient and still give the same information. Um, and the recommendations, and we 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 have our TA statement. Uh, it's part of the packet of information that you all um, have received that's on the table. Um, this TA statement hasn't gone out publicly yet because we've been including them in our uh, semiannual outcomes reports. It will be included in the semiannual outcome report. We just figured for tonight it was you may as well have it. Um, so the recommendations that we had found with this, um, with the force audit was to really use the force audit in looking in the training needs assessment to find where training needs could be drawn out from that force audit. Um, to utilize the force audit findings to identify potentially problematic trends uh, that relates to the EIS system, uh, the employee information system, um, as well as also increase ownership of the, of the uh, findings report and the deficiencies and reduce the silo mentality. Um, the, it, it has to be a collective effort throughout PPB. It can't be a matter of this is for the inspector to look at, or this is only for one person to look at and do something about. It has to be, it has to be organizational wide. You were done with that one. I am done with that be one. Before yeah. we go on and or open it up, I just wanted to, just the big picture for those of you who aren't down in the weeds about this stuff is that, in order to document the nature and extent of force and excessive force by the Portland Police Bureau, there has to be good metrics. There has to be record keeping. Uh, on these, there has to be these force incident reports, and they are, they exist. And the auditing uh, bureau, uh, under uh, the leadership now of Lieutenant Steve Jones, who I believe is here tonight or was here. He's, he's here. Yes, there he is in the back. For those of you that don't know him, uh, point him out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, they have, uh, with our assistance too, have developed this massive system to audit these force reports to make sure they're complete and accurate. And that is what Tom's been talking about here. And uh, it's a massive system. It's a ton of work. But it really now has been able to identify how good a job the officers on the street are doing in filling out those force reports. And then how good the supervisors are doing in reviewing them and going up the chain of command when there's a problem with them. Or if there are, are they detecting them and, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, it's the first basis for you know uh, figuring out the only with, only with a good system like that are you able to see how much force is being used, when is it excessive, and and how big a problem you have without that. And and just to also put it in perspective, I believe it was a, about a year ago that we started actually trying to figure out what variables were needed to be collected and and really going into this process. So I'm. You know, we, we've put it in our previous reports, um, but this has been a very iterative process of looking at what variables were necessary, uh, what the variables have shown us, problems that have occurred along the way, and really making this a solid piece um, for compliance. Do you want to ask now if there's any comments? Are there any clarifying questions from the co-op members? So we'll go to the next item, sure. please. I think you have a community. Uh, no, the next. Is it the community if they want? Oh, yeah. Are we going to ask the community? Yeah. Yeah. We were going to do that at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, we'll go to the, the training needs assessment. Um, and this, again, this is a TA statement that is a part of your packet. Um, so. I, I kind of want to go over needs assessments in general real quick, um, just so we can see how, how the PPB training needs assessment reflects that. So uh, generally a needs assessment, it, I, it occurs when you can see that an intervention is necessary, that there's a problem, that there are gaps in the current way of addressing that problem. Um, and once you recognize that there is that problem that it needs to be addressed, you have to find how to define that problem um, and different sources of information are going to be best uh, to define that problem. So 
I give this example of uh, 911 and mental health calls. If you ask 911 operators, how do we define this problem? One response that they may give is the community needs to be uh, informed of what we need to know to best to best serve them. If you ask the community, though, they may say 911 operators need to know these questions to ask us. So being able to get all of sources of information, all possible ways of defining the problem, and really bringing that all in and highlighting all of the aspects of the problem uh, should go into the needs assessment. So our recommendations that are found in the TA statement for the, for the police bureau is getting that information from all stakeholders, all groups for each section, um, each major section of the uh, training needs assessment. Um, and also expanding the ways that they collect information, collect those sources of information. So one thing that we've suggested is a training suggestion box, something where police officers and community members, a centralized location where they could go in and say, this is a suggestion that I have for how PPB might want to train. Um, Incorporating findings from training evaluations uh, should also be a part of the needs assessment. One of the things is a knowledge retention analysis, um, looking and seeing do we need to train on something every three years because that's how we've always done it, or have we found out that actually officers retain the knowledge for more than three years, maybe we can hold off on that training because they already understand it and bring in other types of training that, that may not have been able to be brought in. Um, ensuring that the training plan uh, tracks all the identified needs, and I'll get into that in a second uh, with the next slide on the training audit, but making sure that no needs that have been identified aren't addressed either in this year's training plan or in, in subsequent year's training plans. Um, and, and finally, distinguishing between best practices and popular practices. Um, the term best practices uh, is, is often misunderstood. If, if 100 police agencies throughout the country are doing something, that doesn't necessarily make it a best practice, it just makes it a popular practice. So being able to have, being able to look and see what, what does the research show, is this, a, is this actually a best practice or is it just being implemented because other agencies across the country got it from each other. So really looking at empirically what best, practice, best practices are. Are there any clarifying questions from the co-op? I don't understand exactly what you mean by empirically how you establish what are best practices. Looking at um, outcome measures, looking at whether the effect that it was designed to have is actually occurring. Um, so if you say I'm, I'm going to uh, implement a training plan that everybody else says really, really helps you not use excessive force, well, do the outcomes show that? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? And is it, is it actually doing it? Rather than just saying, well, everybody else is doing it, let's do it as well. We have to admit, though, that in the field of police training, uh, there are very few really good evaluations. Most of what's out there has not been carefully evaluated. Uh, so the secondary sort of set of criteria would be, um, is this um, based on good research about human behavior, about police community interactions? There's lots of other bodies of research that can be applied. Uh, and so therefore, is the model that's created theoretically compelling? Does it have a logical, if you did this, you, this would happen because we have research in other areas. We have you know, lots of studies in psychology and other fields, anthropology and linguistics about interpersonal communication and what needs to go into that to have effective communication, to not increase tensions, to avoid threats. And, and it, it, is it drawn on that, or is it just we're doing this because you know San Diego does this and New York does this, which is what we see too often in policing? Other questions? Okay. Go to the um, next one. Uh, 
the training audit. So um, we, we've spent a good bit of time, as you can see, with the training needs assessment and looking at kind of how to approach training. Um, so one of the things in paragraph 85 is uh, the inspector must audit the training program, uh, training division, and, and make sure that the training division is carrying out their responsibilities. Um, so we have, we have not yet put a TA statement out on this, um, a technical assistance statement out on this. There's other aspects that we'll, we'll still need to cover, but just kind of some of the things that we've looked at in terms of the training audit um, is really looking at the training plan and making sure that you know, these questions can be answered. Are the identified needs that are found in the needs assessment, are they addressed in the training plan? Um, if not, are there plans to address them in the future? Um, how many years has a training need gone by without being addressed? Um, again, and this just goes back to if you can identify a needs in the training needs assessment, then don't let it just fall by the wayside um, and, and make sure that it is being addressed. And so that's one of the things that we would ask the inspector to look at for the training audit. Um, are the training records accessible? Um, the learning management system, and I apologize, I use LMS here, uh, but that stands for learning management system. Uh, it is not yet in operation yet, um, but that will go a long way in making sure that training records are accessible and they have accurate training records. Um, there's also a question about pass, fail, and complete categories um, as to whether those can adequately capture uh, how students are doing in, in, in the training and whether that, that's a true, accurate, and uh, comprehensive record. Um, and finally, the, the directives and policies and acknowledging of, of reading the directives. And one of the things that PPB should be given credit for is that in the future, directives will require a learning evaluation. As you read this directive, it's not a matter of just saying, I read it, I understand it, I had the chance to ask questions, but do you really understand it? And I think that that's, a, that's a, something, like I said, PPB should be given much credit for is making sure that officers truly do understand the policy and that they've read it and understand it. Questions? <clears throat> yes. yes. <clears throat> I'm curious. Mm -hmm. With the uh, investigation, how do we select the investigator or is the, the auditor? The auditor, rather. How does the person become trained to become an auditor for the PPB? I'm just curious about that process. I'm not sure. Well, the, the, the auditor is uh, within the Portland Police Bureau and was selected by the administration. I think that's what we're talking about here. Correct. So um, the, um, I can't comment on how that person was selected originally. Um, uh, the auditor um, was uh, Lieutenant Jones, but he has now been promoted to the compliance coordinator position. I forgot to mention that earlier. I apologize. Um, but uh, that's a decision for the Bureau, I believe, to, to have someone. And uh, uh, we happen to have Chief Marshman here this evening. I see him in the audience. So, I mean, he, uh, in the end, I don't know if that position has been filled since... Uh, uh, not, not at this time. Okay. And, and paragraph 85 of the settlement agreement specifically identifies the inspector as the person who should be doing the training audit. Um, so it wasn't who should be in this, you know, it, it's the, the settlement agreement says the inspector must audit the training program. Um, you had a question? Have you reviewed the uh, instructional system design model for training? that has been implemented in Seattle? Uh, we, we have not reviewed this. I, I have not reviewed the Seattle one. I shouldn't say we. OK. Um, well, I would summarize that it's a very comprehensive model to avoid ad hoc, week by week, year by year, uh, trainer by trainer approaches to training mm -hmm. the Bureau and bring some um, sophistication, some direction to it. Um, so are you looking at those kinds of things when you're reviewing what Portland is doing? 
the I, I think the kind of the theory that you're seeing of a comprehensive understanding of and then making it instead of I believe like you just said ad hoc and that's why in terms of the training needs assessment what does that need to include how does that inform the training plan how does the force audit in, you know inform and so again with with the with the force audit we had discussed about the silo mentality of having this this very uh, rigid structure but instead it, it has to be comprehensive including all things and making it as solid as possible there's a recommendation that has been but passed out of the data systems use of force uh, compliance subcommittee mm -hmm. to recommend that, that Portland implement the Seattle uh, instructional system design model to provide a training basis that is uh, much more dynamic <clears throat> and comprehensive than currently exists. And in talking to people familiar with training in Portland, mm -hmm. they don't have it. So I'm concerned that you're not looking at that kind of system, that kind of model, whether it's in Seattle or someplace else. Um, because uh, Portland's approach to training, historically and currently, I believe, is ad hoc from moment to moment. It's not systematic. It is um, a reflection of individual trainers. And if you look at the actual training, much of it, I think, is disgusting. And, and, and disappointing and not furthering constitutional policing. So I would urge you, if you're gonna be assessing the training by the Bureau, mm -hmm. that you look at best practices. And well. Maybe Seattle's isn't the best practice. But if you're not looking at those kinds of things, I think you're failing uh, in, in your oversight and, well. and compliance assessment. We've already told you that we, we've looked at training in other places. I've spent 30 years doing this. Have you observed the training in the Portland Police Bureau? I've observed some of it, yes. How many hours of it? Well, I, you know, I, well, I, you're, you just, I, I don't think a debate uh, yeah. this level is really appropriate, Dennis. Okay. You know, if you have issues, so my, much time I'm spending trying to work on these issues, I'm sorry. My We're point, doing our best. Okay. We're volunteers. We're all doing our best. That's my point. So um, we are observing. We have a lot more observing to do. We don't like to draw conclusions until we have observed extensively. We also know of models that have been used in many other cities. Seattle's a, a good city. Uh, I think that's some good things happening there. Uh, again, they don't have the evidence that their models are working. They don't have the scientific evidence. Portland, we are helping Portland develop an evaluation plan that will determine the quality of the instructors, the content of the courses, the immediate impact on attitudes, behavior, and perception, and the long-term impact on street-level behavior. So we are following a Kirkpatrick model that was suggested earlier. We are using advanced <laughs> scientific techniques to evaluate, but the, uh, we're open to ideas, and we certainly will look more carefully at the Seattle model. It's not the job of the COCOL to do the training of the Portland Police Bureau. We're to help them evaluate their auditing system and, evaluate, and help them evaluate their needs assessment, and, but we will provide our expertise and training. Uh, we have done I have developed training programs in policing. We have implemented randomized trials to assess the impact of training on police officers in the topic areas relevant to the settlement agreement. So we do have some experience here. So uh, Merlaviani Riviere is, uh, is participating remotely and she has a question. Uh, first of all, she wanted to thank uh, Chief Marshman for your attendance tonight. Um, and her question, she writes, with respect to outcomes and or impacts, is the COCO linking affect and effect within their models, especially within the training and EIS components and elements? Affect and effect, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and which components? Uh, oh, sorry, she wrote, especially within the training and EIS components and elements. Um, well, we're, we're planning to look at affect and we're going to encourage them. It's not our job to do the evaluation, so we want to emphasize that again. Uh, we're suggesting metrics that they can use, and we've done that already in some areas. 
effects, of course, I assume she's referring to the impact of the program on, on the officers, and uh, you have to begin by increasing their knowledge about things. You have to then change their attitudes and their perceptions about things. And they need practice in, in the behaviors in the training academy and then in the field. There's behavioral intentions, but there's actual behavior. So there's a lot of different levels of measuring this stuff that need to happen to make it to really know what, because sometimes a program can change knowledge but have no effect on their behavior on the street. Sometimes it can change their attitude but have no effect on their behavior. Uh, Amy may want to comment on just the EIS training you have observed. EIS. Oh, no. ECIT. Oh, oh, ECIT. Was she, you were referring to ECIT, right? No. no. EIS. Oh, EIS. And I, th I think one of the things, too, is that we, we are looking at, at all of these things. Um, Part of it, though, is helping PPB implement the system where they can look at it. Um, I think it would be somewhat unfair for us just to look at it and not help them incorporate things uh, such as the Kirkpatrick model and looking at how that can best be implemented department-wide um, so that they can look at it, too. Is the Kirkpatrick ma model being used by any other police bureaus in the country that you're aware of and successfully? I know it is being, I, I'm not, I don't have the specific department, but I know that it is being used because it has been, uh, NIJ had a uh, paper out about how to apply it uh, more broadly to police agencies. But you don't know whether it's been used successfully in other jurisdictions, but it's being relied upon here? It's a theoretical framework for looking at training. It's not a training program. It has no content. Uh, it just tells you how to think about programs in terms of immediate effects, long-term effects. We've added to it. We've suggested um, we're working on a technical assistance piece right now on uh, training evaluation for the Portland Police Bureau, and then we'll cover some of these issues. And we'd be happy to look at the Seattle model as well. Again, they're, uh, the content of these things, they'll have to be specific to the settlement agreement, and there's nothing about the Kirkpatrick model that has anything to do necessarily with the settlement agreement. So it's just a way of thinking about things. And it, it can be critiqued as well. I mean, it's not perfect. I don't, I don't, I'm not in love with it, so. Philip. I have a question. I'd like to clarify <clears throat> before we go on. With the training assessments, is there none? Are there resources? Um, information that's been collected. Information that has been collected, is that correct? There, there has been, yes. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, my question is how do you yeah, as, approach the information that's been assessed? How do you compare it to other cities? How do you, what helps you get a head start on what's the best way to approach Portland as compared to another city? Uh, you know, what's, what's the baseline there? Uh, you know, culturally, Portland, how do we compare? How do, how do we address that information and start assessing it and decide what the best way is to go about doing that? How do you how do, you do that? Well, you're, you're guided by these general frameworks, but you're also guided by good, we're researchers by training. So we spent our life training PhD students and others in how to do good research. So we think a lot about how do you measure things? How do you measure someone's attitudes? How do you measure their behavior? And um, we've already looked, I'll just you know, give you one example. Um, the front end of this Kirkpatrick model is about um, reaction. reaction. Did the students react well to the training? But we don't feel it's sufficient to just ask, did you like the training? Um, we think it's much more complicated. And ha actually, being professors at universities, I have shared with uh, them already a list of over 500 different ways to measure instructor performance. And we've suggested maybe 20 of those ways that we think are relevant here. And there are specific kinds of things that you, where you uh, instructors can be evaluated uh, in the way that they uh, whether they, you think they're competent, whether the way they present the material, uh, you know, the, uh, the content of what they're pre presenting, whether it's adequate, 
or not, whether it's understandable and easy to work with. Um, and uh, then, so there's so many different dimensions of performance, frankly, that go beyond. And so because we've thought about this, we're trying to get them to think beyond sort of this simple ways of measuring things to more complex ways. And, uh, and they have some smart people there that I, we hope are responsive to that. I don't know if that answers. And, and also to kind of piggyback on yeah. that. Yeah, it does. Going back to, um, he has another. And you have more in the presentation. I'm sure they'll relate to this information going forward. So thank you for clarifying. And then going, uh, kind of just going off of that too. But looking at, you know, kind of having a recall to the needs assessment and defining the problem from all areas. Not only looking at how the students perceive the training, but how the students perceive the material, how the students perceived uh, the presentation style, and also from another perspective, how the trainer perceived the training, how the trainer perceived how it could be improved. So really, again, just taking that entire comprehensive look and applying that to each step of the, of the Kirkpatrick model. And that's it for me. Okay. So as many of you know, a primary focus of the settlement agreement is mental health crisis response. And I'm gonna focus just on um, some data that we've collected looking at PPP officers sort of experience of some one of the reforms that's been implemented. So initially, um, Portland Police Bureau had all officers complete 40 hours of crisis intervention training. Um, and with the settlement agreement, they moved to maintaining that level of training for everybody, but also adding um, enhanced CIT, which involves officers that volunteer to go through an additional 40 hours of training and then being identified as the officers to be dispatched to a subset of mental health crisis calls. And the initial criteria for that was uh, mental health crisis calls where the person was violent or had a weapon, a suicide attempt with a weapon, a suicide attempt on a bridge or um, in traffic, um, when requested by the caller or requested by another officer. Um, Recently, um, in discussions with DOJ, PPB moved to expand that criteria a little bit to include all suicide attempt calls um, so that that criteria is expanded somewhat. And we wanted to get a sense of how the ECIT officers as well as the other officers were experiencing the reforms that have been put into place, what their perception was, as well as um, their sense of what the impact would be of expanding the criteria for ECIT calls. Um, and, and just to step back a little bit, the Memphis model of CIT, um, typically departments doing that, a CIT officer is dispatched to any call that's identified as having a mental health component. Um, in Portland, the model's implemented a little bit differently since everybody has a, the initial CIT training, the ECIT officers have a somewhat more limited criteria in kind of determining what the impact would be of expanding that. Um, and we're collecting some data looking at that that we hope to have for the outcomes report, but what I'm gonna talk about now is two types of data that we collected from PPB officers. Um, we actually have done our second organizational survey at PPB, asking officers for to, to complete a survey about a number of different aspects related to the settlement agreement, and I'll talk about some questions related to mental health response in a minute. The other approach that we did to get a little more depth um, of understanding is we did some focus groups. We did a total of six, half were with non-ECIT officers, and then the other three were with ECIT officers. And we asked them about responding to mental health related calls, uh, about their perception of when ECIT um, is helpful to have involved, as well as what they thought about expanding criteria and the reforms that the department is doing. And so I'm gonna report on some of the themes that have come up. Um, and first I'm gonna start with some themes that came up in the non-ECIT focus groups. And a lot of the officers talked about that they're fairly comfortable responding to mental health related calls without asking for ECIT assistance. Um, that they feel like they've had a lot of practice and they have a, a basis of training for doing that. 
Um, they do feel like sometimes that they need to call an ECIT officer for assistance because they're supposed to. So, so there was a little bit of talk of checking the box and not being really sure that they needed an ECIT officer sometimes when they requested one to make sure they met that requirement. And that's something that we're going to track over time as they, as they have a better understanding of when ECIT um, is needed or not, and um, hopefully as there's more recognition of wh where the ECIT officers are particularly helpful in these calls. So that's something we'll want to look at a year from now and see how they feel about that as well. Um, but there's also some themes related to sort of weighing the need to engage someone who may not want to be engaged with by police to, to be taken for evaluation or services and liability that could be involved with actually engaging and if things don't go well, what that might mean. So there was a little bit of talk about that as well um, and how proactive and concerns about when they are proactive and engaging. Next slide. Clarifying questions? We're actually going to go through a couple of oh, okay. slides about Great. this and then try to is, and if then that's all right. together? Yeah, no instead problem. of otherwise it'll get too broken up. Okay, sounds good. Um, for um, the focus groups with the ECIT officers, a number of themes came out there as well. Um, a lot of the ECIT officers talked about that the skills that they learned through their ECIT training are applicable to a lot of calls, so they use them quite often, not just in mental health crisis calls. Um, when we asked about what the impact of the expanded criteria has been, um, they talked about how it sort of puts a strain because sometimes it requires a cross-precinct response. So if there's a need for an ECIT officer and there isn't full coverage in all of the precincts, an officer may have to leave his or her precinct to respond. Um, and currently with staffing levels, that, that sometimes puts a strain on officers being able to respond to all the calls that they're um, they need to. And that's another thing that we'll want to be tracking over time. Um, there was a new class of ECIT last fall. There'll be additional classes. So if, if capacity expands, some of that um, may be relieved. Um, there was also, we, we had asked early on, there was a concern expressed about expanding the criteria and that um, some officer, non-ECIT officers might dump calls on ECIT officers and, and kind of make the workload extra heavy for the ECIT officers and being kind of a disincentive for someone to become an ECIT officer. And we heard some mixed sort of opinions on that. There were some officers that felt they'd experienced it a little bit, but other officers didn't seem quite as concerned about that and they didn't see, seem to have that happening as often. Um, in terms of the hot calls not approached differently, hot calls are calls that would be um, robbery in progress, assault in progress, and the ECIT officers said that they respond to those types of calls as any officer would be, so that's not necessarily something that would bring in ECIT call. And then the big thing that we heard quite a bit is that they're very frustrated with um, the county and state mental health resources that oftentimes they're responding to a lot of things that the mental health system has sort of dropped the ball on and they have very few options to effectively link people. So that's another theme that um, you know they could only do so much. They have the extra training but it only takes, um, the, res the response can only be so effective if the ball gets dropped down the line. There was a few themes that we heard from um, both ECIT and non-ECIT officers. Um, one is that it, you know calls don't always fit in a specific box as a mental health crisis call or something else. So um, that what they're responding to is pretty complex, and oftentimes people and calls may fit several categories. Um, there seemed to be sort of a resounding opinion that having ECIT officers respond to all calls with any mental health component um, would be unnecessary, um, that that would be a very large volume and there's many calls that may be lower level types of calls, um, maybe someone that may want to go to the hospital voluntarily or something along those lines that ECIT response wouldn't be needed. Um, number of officers talked about how the ECIT training doesn't necessarily make you better for the call, that um, the training is good but experience is even better, um, that what they've learned, they've learned a lot on the street. Um, so, so that's something that's important. They really stress that they learned a lot being out there. Um, the training sort of adds but it's, it um, 
is not as important as street experience. Um, and finally, um, they, both the types of officers talked about identifying a mental health crisis was pretty straightforward. They're generally able to identify a call that's a mental health crisis um, unless drugs are involved, which of course that can be quite often. Um, but they, they felt pretty confident if it's a straightforward mental health crisis call that they'd be able to recognize it. So that's the focus group data. And I can take questions on that or I can talk a little bit about the survey data that covers some of the same topics and then we can have people ask questions about both. Would that work better? Maybe. Club members, do you have? I think you should just continue. Okay. So we've now done two organizational surveys. They're online surveys where we ask PPB sworn personnel to complete a, a rather lengthy survey um, of a, a variety of topics related to the settlement agreement. And again, I'm just going to focus on some of the questions that we've looked at related to mental health crisis response. Um, and we, we officers, um, we had a pretty good response rate from officers. A total of 370 complete surveys um, were we have data on for these questions. Um, so I'll start first with some questions about just officers' um, confidence in their ability <coughs> to respond to mental health calls. Um, and they tended to feel that they were pretty confident in their knowledge and skills to recognize mental illness um, and to de-escalate crisis situations. Um, a little bit less con confident in terms of their ability to link people to appropriate mental health services um, and making a BRS referral. And for people who may not be familiar with all the PPB acronyms, a BRS referral is an electronic referral that officers can use to refer someone to the behavioral health response team, um, which is a ECIT officer and clinicians that will follow up with people and work to link them with services. Um, so they, they felt a little bit less confident, although th three quarters um, felt that they could, that they were fairly confident in doing that. Um, officers generally were pretty confident in their fellow officers' abilities as well. Next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, the next is a group of questions that we looked at just what their perception of, of responding to mental health calls. And the first item that mental health crisis is an important function of law enforcement. So they were about split half and half with agreeing or disagreeing. And this could be interpreted several ways and we probably need to do a little more work talking to people to kind of figure it out. It could be that they don't think it's that important to do. Um, but it also could be that they feel like this shouldn't be a role of law enforcement, that really the mental health system needs to step up and, and do its job so that law enforcement isn't the primary responder to these calls. So we don't really have the data right now to, to say which it is, um, but it's something that we certainly want to continue to look at. Um, also looking at um, officers, 92% um, felt that responding to mental health calls can be dangerous for police officers. They also endorsed that mental health calls re response requires compassion. Um, they were a little bit split in terms of whether or not ECIT reduces the risk of officer injuries. And again, ECIT is a relatively new program. This is something we may want to track over time to see if sort of the general organizational sort of view of the benefit of having CIT changes over time. Okay. Um, and then the last group of questions is about um, <coughs> really officers' perception of PPB's effectiveness in responding to mental health calls, um, as well as um, utilizing ECIT. And the first question, they're pretty split on whether PPB is effective at keeping people with mental illness out of jail. Um, and so, so that's what that is. Um, in terms of whether or not it's easy to access an ECIT, officer when needed, they were pretty split on that as well. And again, that's something, an indicator that we will really want to track over time. As capacity expands, as well as officers um, get more comfortable accessing ECIT, hopefully those numbers will increase in terms of officers that agree with that, um, and they will find it easy to access that. Um, in terms of the behavioral health unit being an effective resource re for reducing repeat contacts, 
Um, almost three quarters indicated that they felt that was true. Um, so that includes the behavioral health response teams that do follow up with people to, to link them to services in hope of reducing their contact with the criminal justice system. Um, the final question um, that I'm going to talk about is um, whether or not they felt that expanding the ECIT criteria would improve PPB effectiveness. And only a little over a quarter of the respondents felt that that would. Um, so, and three quarters felt that it wouldn't. And that was something we really we, we wanted to look at. And we'll be collecting additional quantitative data, not just officers' perceptions and opinions, to look at mental health calls, whether or not they're getting um, an ECIT response and looking at what impacts expanding criteria might have or if it's necessary. Um, the department is actually implementing some new data collection to better collect data on mental health calls and that will be, the, once that's really um, good data, we'll be able to, to, to say more about that and provide more feedback to the Bureau about kind of steps moving forward. Um, so. What I've talked about, too, for these surveys is um, I didn't really break up groups of officers, but in our outcomes report, we'll go more in depth in some of these questions. We'll be able to compare responses from this survey to the survey we did a year before to see if there's been any change. We'll also be able to break it down and look at if there's a difference between ECIT officers and non-ECIT officers in their opinions of response. Um, but this is pretty hot off the press data, so we're working on writing that up, and we'll have more in that report. Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to ask you to move right into outcomes because we're falling a little bit behind. I want to allow enough time for community members to um, ask questions and to give comments. So if you can just okay. briefly go into outcomes, that'd be great. Okay, I will move kind of, uh, well, I don't know how quickly, hopefully quickly through this. Um, depending on your understanding of this, this could be boring, but I, the idea here, it's important to understand. So the settlement agreement requires in paragraph 173 that we lead a semi-annual qualitative and quantitative outcome assessment to measure the city and PPB's implementation basically of the agreement. Um, so you know the city is expected in other words to put in place some competent systems that will uh, are needed in order to guide the implementation of this reform and measure its impact as well. So our part of our job is to look at um, the right sort of records and metrics and, and measurement systems and see that they're in place uh, so that the police bureau can monitor its own performance and ultimately it also allows us as the COCAL to determine whether the reforms are moving the needle on these metrics. Uh, this is kind of what we've been talking about earlier about establish, it is what we were talking about earlier. So. Um, it's actually a long and complex process of getting these systems in place. We're providing the PPB with technical assistance, as you can see in some of these areas, with concrete recommendations about what needs to be done to create these systems and achieve this goal. So um, they, they have to develop, according to the settlement agreement, competent systems in five basic areas. This slide here shows the first couple. One is create systems and resources for responding to persons in mental health crisis. Uh, second is competent accountability and oversight systems. The third is, which is on the next slide, effective training for police officers that increases their knowledge, skills, and abilities to, uh, for effective and successful delivery of service to persons in mental health crisis. And then the proper management of use of force to meet constitutional standards. And finally, robust systems of community engagement. So those are kind of the five core pillars of the settlement agreement anyway. But in each area, they have to develop systems. You can't just say, yeah, we did this and we did a good job. Uh, you know, there has to be ways of measuring that. And that's largely what the discussion is about tonight. Both uh, Tom and Amy have talked about those to some extent. Um, let me just comment briefly on some of those. We will have another outcomes report in October. We're kind of in between reports right now. Uh, you've already gotten a, a preliminary peek at, at some of those data. Um, and uh, we, uh, in addition to the PPB's own data systems that are some of existing, such as for some being created, such as the audits, uh, the COCAL also oversees additional data collection. Um, one is the citywide survey that we worked with the COAB to create, and the other is the, uh, the police officer employee survey that Amy has already alluded to, and I'm going to come back to in a minute to give you some different results. 
uh, we'll continue to work with them to measure, uh, to determine that these measures are, you know, uh, that the city has developed and the police bureau are appropriate, reliable, and valid indicators of systematic change in the desired outcomes. So uh, maybe the first one uh, on, uh, if you can go back a couple slides, the, the yeah. first one there. Maybe Amy, just make a comment or two about capable systems uh, for responding. I know you've alluded a little bit to that. Right, and in terms of data collection for that, um, w the Bureau right now is implementing something that you'll hear more about probably, um, and it will be in our outcomes report, it's called the mental health mask, which will allow them to capture better data on mental health calls. So that way they'll be able to look at what is happening in these calls. Are the calls that are meeting criteria for ECIT getting ECIT response, and what is the impact of that? So right now they're, they're really getting that system in place so we'll be able to look at quantitative outcomes of how things are going and use that as a, a feedback loop um, into the program. Okay, thank you. Um, the second one there, competent accountability and oversight. Um, the agreement requires them to implement a, an employee information system. Maybe that was what V was alluding to before the EIS. Uh, to identify at-risk employees and doing this by looking at records and there's these EIS administrators that uh, flag officers who are engaging in potentially problematic behaviors uh, and the idea is to intervene to keep them you know out of trouble with coaching or other assistance uh, you know it's all in terms of the rates of use of force and the frequency of these things per month and how it's compared with other officers on average if they're two or three times above the rate, then they get flagged. Um, other places call these early intervention systems or early warning systems. Uh, we've studied the system. We've made suggestions for expanding the use of the system. Uh, both the COCAL and DOJ have uh, discussed ways that the PPB can strengthen management's oversight, uh, getting supervisors more involved with at-risk employees. Uh, for example, we recommend they flag people at a higher rate and that they also forward mo more of the cases for supervisory review. We would like to see supervisors more involved in their employees' lives. Right now, it's, you know, the, a lot of the cases are being flagged, but then they're being disposed of by these administrative uh, administrators in EIS. And, and both the reasons for them not sending them forward through the chain of command uh, we'd like to know more about, and we think that we'd like to get supervisors more involved. Uh, we also would like to see EIS used in a more predictive fashion. That was the idea, that you could uh, use data, develop fancy, sophisticated mathematical algorithms to uh, help predict who's likely to be at risk and who isn't. Um, I have to give PPB credit. They've done some preliminary work with the data, which is promising. Uh, we've also, and they've looked at other cities and our, recommendation, our recommendations, they've looked at other experts uh, who are doing some work in other cities and at other universities. So they're working on that. But uh, there's a way to go on that, and, and, the, and it's, it's, it's cutting edge stuff, so it's not, the, the, out, the fruitfulness of it is yet to be determined, but the reality, frankly, as we say, is that, you know, officer misconduct, officer use of force is not randomly distributed. There are individual officers, like in all aspects of life, who are much more likely to engage in behavior that's out of policy and that's excessive. And if we can predict who they are in advance, if we can uh, either save their careers or save people from being injured or hurt in the community, uh, that's a, a, an important predictive process rather than just reacting to everything. Um, also, there's the issue of data on allegations of policy violations by officers, um, including the average length of time for investigating complaints. Uh, I think that's a meeting going on right now. Uh, one of the big issues uh, is related to the independent review process. Why can't more cases be reviewed within the 180-day requirement of the settlement agreement? Uh, and we're waiting t for the conclusion from a city's, uh, I think they call it a focus group, uh, which is in the process of sort of rethinking the way uh, things are done with regard to independent review, and, and that may have effect on a CRC uh, meeting uh, function as well. Um, we did find that three out of four allegations were not investigated uh, 
as they were either declined by the independent uh, police review or internal affairs. And this low rate of investigation is a primary concern of DOJ and one of the realities that we feel needs to change in the review process. So let me move on to effective training real quickly. Um, We've already covered training, I feel. So I think I, I want to add to that. So Tom talked a lot about the training needs assessment, the training audit. As I indicated earlier, we are also trying to provide guidance on how to evaluate the effectiveness of training. So we are setting up metrics with them and doing a TA statement on that that will be out. Uh, so we have a lot of experience there. We've also observed uh, ECIT training and service training. Uh, as Amy's, well, we didn't really talk about that much, but you know, it's generally uh, pretty solid in some areas. But uh, you know, the impacts unknown, as we talked about earlier, and we recommend uh, refresher training uh, in crisis intervention skills. Uh, methods for doing some of this stuff. Uh, classroom surveys are really important uh, to measure knowledge and, and, and skill level uh, to make sure that people are proficient before they go back in the field. Focus groups can be done as well. A contact survey is another possibility. I know that Chief Marshman's taking this very seriously as an area to explore the costs and benefits. As contact surveys measure public satisfaction and the quality of police service during one-on-one -on -one encounters. Dennis, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to try to wrap it up. Wrap it up because I really want to allow. All right, let me. Um, I'm going to go to the stuff at the end because that's the most interesting. I think that we've got charts here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to add something to the metrics that we haven't really talked about much that we feel is important to the list of outcomes, and that's the change in police culture uh, that's needed to bring about real reforms. Um, so uh, this has implications for police leadership and for creating systems that will not be challenged or ignored by officers. So we have this national crisis of police legitimacy, but very few people have taken the time to talk to police officers about their views of the reform and what it's like to be a police officer in this kind of politicized environment. Uh, we're doing a big national survey right now with the Pew Research Center on this topic, but our survey in Portland also has questions that deal with this. So um, my point here is that um, we can learn a lot about the police culture. We can measure it. Uh, Amy and Tom have both given you examples of that. It gives us a window into the culture. On some, of the, there's a lot of positive findings in there. I find that Portland police officers are fairly community oriented as a group, uh, despite external criticism. They believe in community policing. They believe in just procedurally just interaction and encounters, uh, and they believe in treating people with mental uh, illness uh, fairly and uh, sensitively. They hold positive views of the community overall, but they most of them like their job. Many feel, however. Uh, feel the stress and burnout of the job. Uh, they realize their relationship with the community is strained right now, and they feel they're being treated very unfairly by the media and uh, are concerned about their own safety issues. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that now, um, leadership, we measure leadership. Leadership uh, uh, will we'll report those findings later. There's, there's issues and concerns there, but that, that's understandable un under the current conditions that were uh, existed when we did the survey a month ago. Um, I want to say that uh, in the interest of time, let me focus on, here's, this one is, uh, the, and I'll stick with that first slide for a minute. Uh, the question is, are officers accepting the settlement agreement and seeing its benefits? Do they have a reasonably good attitude about it or something that could help the city and PPB over time? The answer here is not really. Uh, we ask whether they agree or disagree with this statement. That's a exact quote. Uh, you can see if you add up the 82.4% uh, or about eight out of 10 do not agree with the statement that settlement agreement with DOJ is a good thing that will improve the PPB in the long run. An even larger percent not shown here state that it'll be a distraction from their work, and many do not feel the revised policies or use of force are an improvement. The question is why, and are they just complaining? Is it about oversight? Do they have real concerns here? Again, I think we have to pay more attention to officer buy-in uh, in doing reform. I've actually written about this subject in other places. Um, our, the next slide, are officers less willing to stop and question people who seem suspicious or has nothing changed? And you can see here, um, this is another possible problem. Uh, nearly, all, nearly all officers, 99%, 
um, when you add up those two bars, feel police officers are less willing to stop and question people who seem suspicious. This is what we call de-policing, or what some call the Ferguson effect, or you might in Portland call it the settlement agreement effect. Um, so where do we go from this? What do we get from this? Why do we care? Um, officers are concerned. I think I spend a lot of time talking to officers. My point is that we need to pay more attention to their perspective on reform. Uh, to try to understand where they're coming from, and, not, and they are fearful of the consequences of doing their job. Let's drill down a little bit deeper, go to the next slide. In this agency, the discipline process is fair. Most officers feel the discipline system is unfair. This is a nationwide problem. I've studied this in more than 50, more than 100 American cities. Um, Let's go to the next slide uh, to drill down a little deeper. For minor mistakes, the Bureau helps officers with coaching and counseling rather than punishment. Police organizations, I can tell you, after studying them for 30 years, are historically quasi-military and punitive to their employees. We see here that the majority of officers, 58%, do not feel the employee provides coaching or counseling for minor mistakes. So changing that culture takes time. And I pointed out that we need to be careful about the work of the COCOL, the DOJ, the COAB, that we don't simply play into this one message that our goal is to punish every officer who even looks the wrong way. So what are the implications on my last slide here? There are implications for leadership. They have to create a significant, it, it's a significant challenge for new leadership in Portland. I'm glad the chief's here tonight and the commissioner to get officers to believe the settlement agreement uh, in fact, uh, encourages good policing, is good for the police bureau, is good for officers in the long run. Uh, in other words, achieving some buy-in, winning the hearts and minds of the officers. It's, it's critical to gaining compliance. Uh, it's not just their problem, it's also a challenge for all of us. So, and I would argue you need both a, a carrot and a stick approach, uh, a carrot approach, leadership that can inspire officers to be committed to the organizational goals. Um, need to reward good behavior at all levels, uh, an administration that sets clear expectations and standards and establishes fair management systems. The stick side that you have to have auditing and accountability systems in place that monitor compliance with rules, regulations, and policies, but they have to be fair. So importantly, the system has to be fair. Um, you may not realize this, I don't know how many people do, that most police officers want bad cops punished as much as the community. They want also good cops rewarded or at least protected from unfair attacks on them. I call this organizational justice. It's the mere image of procedural justice in the community, which we all talk about. Nationwide, I can tell you that officers do not feel there's organizational justice right now. Uh, they feel that the administration is siding with the media and activists and no one has their back. Uh, if they do anything wrong, make an honest mistake in a difficult situation, they will be penalized. I'm just telling you this is how they feel. Uh, even losing their job, the financial security for their families. So I think we need to understand that when we try to make reforms. Um, so organizational justice is about fairness, respect, giving them a voice. They want to be part of the review process of their, of their organization. Um, and uh, that's the idea. So without that, I, I'm arguing we're fighting an uphill battle to reform the organization, and we need to be just aware of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd, I have a question. I'm curious, related to the uh, community engagement. engagement survey. Yeah. I'm just wondering, just because uh, the community here in Portland doesn't have trust in the police. There's tension right now. And the survey, it looks like people, I'm just making this up, but it looks like 160,000 people live here in Portland, and 20, say 20,000 respond to the survey. And that approach, is that the best approach? I'm wondering, just because maybe we have, oh, like maybe in Northwest we have uh, a town hall two times a month. In Southwest we have you know, a community hall down there, Northeast and whatnot. Dubai. Southeast we could have you know, a town hall there. And, and the police, you know, as a, in a board fashion, sort of, you know, hold that, that meeting and to develop trust in those communities. And then email a survey. That would kind of be uh, a cold, non-human way to interact with people and get a qualitative responses from people and, and to really in, in try to get that change in culture. So if you want to get this... Uh, you know, this cultural change, I'm just wondering, is there a different approach that you think might work? I'm just curious. No, I, 
I think there, uh, Philip makes a really good point. There's a lot of different ways of engaging the community and getting their input. And uh, focus meetings with stakeholders with particular interests. It could be the mental health community. It could be the African-American community. It could be all kinds of different communities should have a voice in this process. And uh, surveys are good w for measuring individual contacts with the police. The vast majority of people do not have contacts, maybe three out of four. So that one quarter that does have contact, we care greatly, and the settlement is about that group as well. Uh, and then the random citywide survey is good to get a random sample. We generally don't get the silent majority that, that come to meetings. Uh, and I could even propose other, I think we need virtual meetings. We need people who are, who don't have the ability to come to meetings, who maybe uh, with through disabilities or whatever cannot, or maybe they're busy and have to watch their kids. They'd like to participate virtually. I know we have some people tonight, but there's so much technology that could be used. And so I think that's, that's a good idea. Um, <clears throat> a comment about some of the general findings that you uh, talked to us about tonight. Uh, number one, this, this is the second survey you've had where the Portland Police Bureau, uh, at least at the 50% level, does not believe, if I understand the question correctly, that it should be part of their job or it's an important part of their job to deal with those in mental health crisis. If I also understand correctly, over 80% of the members of the Bureau do not agree with the purpose or the prospective implementation of the settlement agreement. Uh, third, the COAB now has eight members. Uh, the city's responsible for making sure the COAB is fully staffed at the level of 15. And what you've alluded to, and what I just want to comment on, is that the city and the police bureau is not engaged with true reform. I mean, what this evidence is, is they are not affecting the people on the street. If over 50% don't think it's important to deal with the mentally ill, and in our society, they're the first responders. And if they don't think that the settlement agreement is important, that's a failure of leadership at, I think, the council level, the mayor level, and the chief level, at, at the very least. And that, after four years of the settlement agreement being in place, is um, a tragedy that the leadership in this city, including the, the people I've mentioned, have not taken responsibility for affecting cultural change uh, among members of the Bureau, and I'm, I'm not um, suggesting they may have some legitimate feelings as members of the Bureau about society and so forth, but I don't see the commitment um, from the Bureau of the city to the co-op succeeding or to changing the culture, and that's what I'm hearing from you, at least in some of the, the, the bits of information that, that, I'm, that I'm, I'm hearing, and it's, um, it saddens me. Do you yeah, I, uh, Tom, I hear what you're saying, and I think that uh, I would, uh, I can't comment on the city's response to the issue of staffing the COAB because I think they have to represent themselves. We don't. Uh, we're independent of them, and uh, uh, and I think that's uh, another issue. I just will, uh, n I do think uh, some of our other data do document that, and you'll see it in the report that you have, that. Uh, there was issues with leadership in the police bureau related to, uh, for example, setting up all this auditing and uh, force auditing. You know, people like uh, Lieutenant Jones, who's here, I'll say this in front of him, they worked their butt off to develop this big system, and it just sort of wasn't that well received. Uh, and I think that uh, I'm delighted that there's. Uh, uh, you know, some. I, I just think that we there is new leadership now, so we'll see what happens. And I think that that's one uh, one positive thing, probably. Um, but I hear what you're saying, and I think um, I think some of the stuff too that Amy pointed out is in, is interesting. I don't know that the 
the, the fact that everybody feels that mental health calls are dangerous. I think that's an interesting, that's due to the media too. Uh, every time we talk about a crisis with uh, uh, hate crime or with uh, you know terrorism, whatever, it's always involved mental illness or but then, uh, or the police shootings as well, not always, I'm just saying often, but then when you look at most, the reality is that in most cases with mental health, uh, mental illness does not, is not dangerous. I mean, but it's, it's so it's when we, we selectively see things and uh, just because a few people are dangerous all the time doesn't mean most, would you, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that. Right, I mean, there's a misperception of the risk that's related to mental illness I mean, the other issue with that question is we'd almost need to ask police officers how any call can be dangerous and then compare the difference between if, if, do they think certain types of calls are more different as well. Yeah. Um, but certainly society and police officers as well believe people with mental illness are much more dangerous than they really are. And one quick, you, you had responded, Tom, earlier, but that issue of half not believing it's their job, we, we're not quite sure on that yet about what they're thinking. It might be an enlightened view, Amy is right. pointing out, that they, they're saying, let's get everybody else in the game here. There should you be know. somebody else for people to call when they have a loved one that's in crisis. Um, but you're right, in our society today, police are, are, are who's available. Are we ready for public comment? Yes. So um, I'd like to invite those of you that would like to um, either ask a question or uh, share a comment. Um, you do have three minutes. If you can keep it to two, we'd appreciate it since we're running a little late. Um, just a reminder to, yeah, come on up. Uh, just a reminder to state your name for the record. And uh, if you just kind of keep an eye on me, I'll just sort of tap my, respectfully tap my watch when you're getting close. My name is uh, Joe Walsh. I represent Individuals for Justice. This is the only group that I know of that the group that we're criticizing is allowed to bring their guns into the room. Think about that. There is no other group that I've ever seen and I've been an activist for 50 years, so I've criticized a lot of groups, especially in government. So this group, if it survives, you might want to think about that, what it means to sit here with my back towards police officers who have their guns, and me saying really tough things to the police department. Is that intimidation? Is that subconsciously, will it re help me to resist saying something? Yes. If they have guns, I'm afraid of them. And they do shoot. Just ask Chief O'Day. They do shoot. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there's too much information here tonight. And in this town hall, you would have to be a genius to sit in the seat and follow what you were saying. Now, I'm not dumb. I have a college degree. I've been an activist, been around the block a few times, and I was having trouble. Your audience is the normal citizens that come here in the town halls, in the meetings, trying to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and is there gonna be any results? And let me give you one example. I just got arrested about two weeks ago. The last time I got arrested was about seven years ago. Nothing's changed, take my word for it, nothing. The way the police approached us, the way they talked to us, Nothing's changed. That's the last line. The interaction of somebody coming into contact with the police. And I've been arrested a lot. So I know the procedures. 
I'm a very easy person to arrest because I'm old and I'm tired and I'm not young and I'm not a wise ass when somebody has a gun. I shut up really fast and I know that. You know we don't trust the police. The reason we don't trust the police is they don't trust us. Think about that. Every time we have a protest, we have two levels of police, one you see and one you don't. The one you don't is a riot squad. Sir, I'm going to have to tell you that you're out of time. OK. Um, what you're doing is process. Stop it. Your mandate was to find out what the people of Portland think about the police, what they want, and the interaction. Stop hiding in your offices and get out there. There are hundreds of organizations that would love to have you come, two of you, three of you. Just go talk to them. Don't take my word for it. My word is bias. You need to get out into the community. Stop hiding in offices. Stop doing subcommittees. Go talk to the League of Women Voters. Talk to Dan. Talk to other organizations. And I know I'm over. I'm yeah, over. Yeah. I'm trying to be respectful. And yes. your time, but you're a little over. We've got Thank lots you. of people here. Thank you. Um, Hi, it's Mary Eng here, and it's a pleasure to see all of you. I, I don't mean to dwell on myself, even though I'm a Leo and I was born on July 25th, which we're known for being narcissistic, but also sometimes positive people. We have good qualities. Um, but I just thought I'd tell you who I, who I am. I was born in Portland, Oregon, in North Portland, um, to a social worker who had been placed in Multnomah County due to his dad's get uh, dad's dad getting a letter written to get him a fancy job i wish someone would write me a letter because i want a job too because i want to be able to eat and be prosperous but um he worked in clark county um, helping women write resumes single mothers um he kind of worked I think he might have gotten social worker burnout. I don't know, but I think he wanted to move on to other things, writing and history, primarily music. But my mom was a nurse. She got her background in nursing from uh, joining the uh, Holy Redeemer Society in Pennsylvania who got her out of the rural Pacific Northwest and got her into a career in nursing. She didn't stay with the sisters, obviously, and she eventually met my dad out here in the Northwest. and. She's a Capricorn and he's a Scorpio. And he also is a crime novelist. His final novel was about a social worker who actually is helping the police um, investigate a string of racist murders in Tennessee of little black children. And it's a heartbreaking kind of twisted novel. My mom's first instinct was this is um, kind of too disturbing, too strange. Maybe he's senile, because he, he did eventually have some very severe dementia. So I got to caregive for him through much of my 20s, or possibly my, my whole life, because I was his office assistant and helping to file for him. But um, he cared very much about police brutality. We witnessed it on the way home from the school bus in East Nashville. And I remember mainly his voice, because in his voice, he was a good singer, and he could do like he would do this, like, oh, like this whimpering operatic kind of falsetto-y quivering voice as he pulled me past this police brutality when I'm far too young to be seeing a black man being beaten over with a bully stick. Eventually, the police were beating on me in Tennessee, so I moved to California. And that was due to my mom not liking my hairstyle, my atheism, my vegetarianism, my bisexuality, whatever. And that was all perceived as mentally ill. So I got to experience crisis intervention at 21. And I'll be the first one to admit I have chronic depression, and I have post-traumatic stress, and I have about 12 seconds to wrap it all up. But I think you guys are awesome. I think we need a lot of positivity. We need to accept each other for who we are and listen to each other. And I'm not a co-ab disruptor. I live in Astoria mainly, so I won't be here that often. But um, I was really injured on the arrest, um, 629 initiated by a false report 
by a G4S guy called John Chandler, supposedly, who lied and said I had a corkscrew at City Hall. I've never brought a corkscrew once to City Hall. My thumb's in pain right now. <laughs> but um, I think it's a worthy sacrifice. I felt like a sort of a sacrificial victim to the police procedure. I was not treated properly by Engstrom. It was not a proper arrest, and lying to 911 is a crime. We know that. I um, think Charlie Hills I'm needs to resign. Yeah, yeah and that, I'm that'll sorry. be enough. You know. Well, okay, go. She'll go. Okay, thank you. We're just too polite here. <coughs> Good evening. For the record, I'm Joanne Hardesty, and I am representing myself this evening. I want to thank you for the additional information and for uh, being here this evening. I guess based on the information that you presented tonight, I have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. And so um, I want to go to the survey uh, where data from Portland Police Bureau, the, uh, the first chart that you showed, uh, which was about knowledge and skills around mental illness, um, I'm really concerned that you would uh, lump uh, very confident with moderately com confident in the same category, because I think there's a huge difference between someone who's moderately confident and someone who feels very confident and responding to a mental health call. So as I look at this, 96% say that they're either moderately or very. I really want to know how many are very and how many are moderately and how do we move moderate to very. And so I, so I just wanted to point that out as I think that that's a mislabeling of that uh, section. Um, I also want to talk a little about uh, the consistency in the survey of Portland police officers, I mean, this doesn't look much different than the survey that you did a year ago um, about the attitudes about both the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement and whether or not uh, Portland police officers feel like uh, they are being disciplined fairly and whether or not um, uh, there's, there's a problem within the Bureau. I think fundamentally, your reports pointed out that there is a lack of a specific person throughout Portland Police Bureau, the city council, the city leadership that has the duty and responsibility to track the implementation of the settlement agreement throughout the bureaucratic process. And so when no one is the point person, then no one is the point person, which means there's not anybody to go to to hold accountable for it not moving through the police bureau. And so, I, and I wanna say that I thought Chief O'Day was really committed to the settlement agreement, really committed to equity within the police bureau, and he was moving initiatives through the police bureau. But the chief can't do it by themselves. And if there's not an expectation that the organizational culture will change and that there's an expectation that that culture will change. Um, I've been around long enough to know that people just pace themselves because there's always a new police chief, there's always a new police commissioner, and if you just uh, march in step, it'll be very easy to make that happen. If I may make one last quick point, uh, the last point I wanted to make was, uh, Dennis, you made a comment about we want to, um, impact the hearts and minds of Portland police officers. No, we don't. We actually want police officers who treat everybody under the same constitutional protections that we're all supposed to have. We don't care whether we win their hearts and minds, we give them a paycheck. We, we train them supposedly well, uh, and so it is not about winning hearts and minds, it's about having employees that are public employees doing the job they were hired to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Katie Hole, forgive me. This is all a little scattered, so if it doesn't quite make sense. But I don't know, I think transparency is like a big issue and not to criticize her stuff, but you know, when the newly sworn police chief, it comes out like two days later, there was alleged child abuse and Senator Sarah Gelser is like, can he like actually have the restraint to like lead the police in this time? It does bring up questions, you know, I don't know, but 
you know, there is like, well, what did happen? And, you know, I think part of the problem also is that, you know, they're like reading the article about East Moreland and, you know, Commander Chris Davis going there. I'm like, why are the police even involved in a civil land dispute? And, you know, I asked my dad, who's been a lawyer for years, and he's like, yeah, I don't know why they would either, because I've never heard of like police being authorized to even do that. And then they are like, well, we're understaffed. And I'm like, yeah, if you're spending hours doing things you were never hired or trained to do, of course you're going to have problems like meeting, you know, your other requirements. And the other thing was like, you know, there's Lents and other neighborhood associations who are like, yeah, we would have loved to have the chief show up and they, we've, I mean, our commander and we've never had anything like that, but you know, we don't have the tax bracket East Moreland does, I guess. And yeah, I think just yeah, I think there is, yeah, I do think there is a buy-in issue too. And like, you don't see the top-down leadership where people are like, you know, this may be hard and this may be difficult, but we have to get it done anyway because too many people need us in this hard time. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Pat Adams. And uh, I really came to ad address the co-ed members uh, mostly and um, it comes to me that uh, a lot of what we're talking about is uh, individual officers and officer behavior. And I was encouraged by an officer to really study, or really uh, look at what kind of outcomes that we really wanna change. And it comes to me that um, one of the things that you all can address here is the incarceration of African Americans. And that we really have to stop putting African Americans in prison. Now it comes to me that there's one way to get to prison and that's to be arrested. So we have to stop arresting African Americans to the extent that we have to stop targeting them. There are systematic targeting procedures, practices, right? And no, at no level can we have a relationship between a police organization and a targeted citizenship. You can never target my children and expect to have a relationship with me built on trust, right? We have a gang task force that targets African Americans. We have a, a drug enforcement that targets African Americans, right? We know that if a police officer stops an African American for a burnt out tail light, there's, there's, there's potential there. There's potential there for a tail light, right? We can and to, I believe that who gets arrested is not so much a function of laws. There's plenty of laws. It's not so much a function of the police. It's a function of policies and practices that are both written and unwritten and wittingly and unwittingly enforced. So we can change this by recommending policies and practices that refuse to target African Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Schumann, Portland Cap Watch. Um, it seems to me the elephant in the room right now is the police union because the police union has a huge amount of influence on how the police are run on a day-to-day -day basis and how officers are disciplined. And I want to know from you, Dennis, and, and the rest of you, Amy and Tom, how is it you're going to deal with the fact that when the police officers get disciplined, they go to the union, the union runs them into arbitration, and they win. So you have a system, as far as I can tell, of the police union running the police department, and their goal is not to discipline their officers. And then we have the second leg of that is the union contract is going to be up and it's being secretly negotiated and they're going to apparently put it, make a few changes, put it back in place so that you have the same arbitration agreement. How are you going to deal with that? That's my question to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Hanelman with Portland Cop Watch. I guess my first question is why do we have sign-up sheets at the back of the room if they're not being used? So um, <laughs> I'll get down to that later. Uh, so uh, 
right now there's a meeting going on next door about the IPR and the Citizen Review Committee. And I'm, I have to say, if you're doing all these surveys to see how things are changing over time, I think it's incredibly uh, not an effective way to do uh, your job if you're not looking at how the CRC is functioning now, especially because the changes that were required by the agreement were put in place in city council code um, where they expanded to 11 people and were given the ability to uh, order more investigation. Um, the s solution that's being proposed by the auditor and allegedly city council is to remove public hearings from our process. Uh, and I, we at CropWatch did a, an analysis, which somebody maybe who's being paid to do these analyses should have done, that says that of the last seven cases, none of them were delayed because the CRC was holding public meetings. Um, so I, it's very disappointing that you said that you're waiting for the 180 day review thing to come out before you even look at it. You should look at how it exists now and then see whether the proposal is going to fix the problem. The proposal on the floor is not going to fix the problem and then not let them engage in a, in a process that's not going to fix the problem. Um, I'm glad that you uh, uh, alluded to IPR statistics. You said a per certain percentage of allegations were not even investigated. I think you said only 25% were investigated. The IPR annual report just came out, and they didn't attach any data to it. So we have no idea how many allegations. They said there were 800 allegations, but they didn't say how many were investigated. Um, so if you can urge them to publish those data um, for the public, that would be great. Uh, it also, we had a question that we didn't get answered in one of the things we sent recently. Uh, do the 940 investigations get reported to the civilians involved in the force incident so that then when they see that the supervisor already did an investigation, do they feel less inclined to file a complaint because they feel it's not gonna go anywhere because the 940 was done? One of the 940 uh, incidents came before the CRC and what happened was they interviewed a security guard and three other civilian witnesses and threw out basically the testimony of the civilian witnesses in, in favor of the security guard. Um, so that shows that the, those 940 investigations are very biased and uh, we, ha we have no faith in them. Um, glad about your comments about de-escalation. I don't know if anybody caught, saw that in your report that the police continue to think that de-escalation is saying, if you, if you stop doing that, I won't taser you. That is not de-escalation and you know, keep pushing them on that. That's, very disturbing. Um, very difficult to do anything. In all these systems that you're setting up with all the staff turnover that's happening, um, you know, how are you going to make sure that once a person leaves from the job that these systems stay in place? All right, and I just want to also point out that even though 99% um, of the police say they don't feel like doing their job anymore, crime isn't up 99%. So maybe them not wanting to do their job as much isn't really affecting our crime rate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cass Ann Casper. I came for the artichoke dip tonight. Oh, you guys, it's white sugar. Come on, guys. Um, I am representing myself. I am one of the people who do a lot of meetings, a lot of talk uh, about mental health issues in the community. I don't know if we can call ourselves leaders or not, but we're out there a lot. And I just want to say thank you to V and Philip um, for being here for us, and also Amy and Dennis. So my family has been in Portland for over 100 years and you are outsiders and when you walk into Portland it's not easy and I, I think this process was also very difficult because those people we consider leaders in the peer movements we, there's a peer movements we actually told uh, I wasn't there but the people I work with told City Hall don't hire an outsider and so um, and they didn't listen to us uh, City Hall didn't listen to any of the recommendations that were put forth by the communities who take care of people with mental health issues and so um, and it happened a lot too so I pop in here once in a while and you were I was invited to come give a personal speech I really appreciate you all listening to that um, to bring back the idea of mental health again to this discussion of the co-op so I see that, uh, that you need some more co-op members um, maybe we can help you get some co-op members who are experts in mental health from the experiences of being in mental health the police have actually helped me I mean I probably in 2004 I mean I've been picked up by police here and there um, here and also in Japan and I'm probably here alive because of that help I th believe the police calls get 30 to 40 percent are mental health related and we're not hearing the good stories I hear good stories from my friends 
and uh, there are good stories out there. The number of people that they're taking care of or encountering every day. And Tom, I wrote part of the training for ECIT, so I'm back there to John. Hey, he's complaining about my training. <laughs> but um, as, as a peer, actually, part of the ECIT training, we went through the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, watched a couple times. We went through uh, point by point in that training, and, and a lot of things changed because of our advice. Uh, the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Council is actually the best committee I've ever been on in Portland. We get things done. You can't believe how much work that is. I have seen cultural shifts. I've been with uh, the police in some kind of volunteer manner since 2006, Mayor Potter's committee, and I have seen shifts in the people I've been working with over. They've changed me in 10, 000, in 10 years. I've learned a lot, and I believe the, the interactions with us and the mental health community have changed them. And I see that um, from the top because those are the people that I really have a lot of um, contact with. I do stop by and talk it with officers at Starbucks to check in and see how things are going from their perspective too. But as a person who's been involved in a lot of meetings, I've seen a shift in my own attitude and their own attitude as we're working together. And I have a lot of hope for this. Um, so I'd like to offer, let's, we'll help the co-op process. Let us come back as a mental health communities and we'll do our best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If I may. I'm sorry if I was misunderstood. I don't think I commented at all on the e ECIT training. Okay. Um, I haven't reviewed it. I haven't attended it. I, I didn't, I don't think I said anything about that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to step into community's public comment, but Merlaviani did have one other comment that she wanted to give. Would okay. now be an okay time? She actually asks a question, and I'm just going to read out everything that she, that she sent in. Um, she wrote, cultural change is a human-to-human -human process. Only through genuine and authentic interaction perceived by both parties provide and promote <coughs> social bonding. What is the COCAL doing to measure or suggest alternative forms of human engagement, especially with the communities most deleteriously affected by current police interactions? Such a good vocab. What? Her comment question. Are we supposed to respond to that? Well, well she's a member of the COAB, so yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really good question, and um, I think that the, uh, in my testimony before the President's Task Force, I suggested that w the model of policing that we have in America today is still 1960s approach of just driving around and responding to calls. And we need to have officers get out of their cars, introduce themselves, <coughs> Uh, begin conversations and not interrogations necessarily unless there's reasonable suspicion that a crime has occurred. Um, and by that means you'll get to know the community, you'll get to develop relationships with the community, and uh, you'll know who needs more attention, you'll know what the local problems are. And, uh, and I think that's... Uh, it's time consuming, but you don't build trust as she implied by just having one encounter. And the other is by um, changing the metrics by which you evaluate police performance. Uh, we just had a big meeting in Washington DC last week to stop focusing entirely on crime statistics and start to measure the procedural fairness of encounters and force statistics and complaints and things like that and, and ma have them matter in the public discourse about how you evaluate police performance. There was, a, there was just one other thing that uh, V had wanted to say tonight that's, um, that's something addition, and she just wanted to say, she wanted to let the public know that at the November 2015 accountability subcommittee meeting that we had 23 different social groups in attendance. So I think V wanted to communicate that there was a lot of community participation um, at that meeting. So that's her last comment. Thank you. Are there any other community members that would like to make a comment? And I do apologize, I didn't receive the sign-in sheet for speaking, so. Good evening. My name is Margaret Ann Jones, and I'm a mother, grandmother, retired, and uh, what I want to say is I remember when my children were growing up 
if there was a time that they felt lost or in need of some type of help and they were away from the house, I always used to tell them, look for a police officer. They're gonna be there for you. They were the ones that I tr trusted, I could trust. They were members of our community. We saw them around town. They played ball with the kids. They talked to the kids. And I remember my son coming home saying, Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a police officer. No? Now I have my grandchildren. And I tell my grandchildren, if you're ever stopped, keep your hands at 10 and 2. Do not move any, you know, quickly. I pray. I have to pray for them once they're out that they come back home safely. We live in fear of our police officers, and I don't understand that at all. There are so many homes out there that, um, you know, there's no man in the house or whatever, and I see and I know of extraordinary police officers who, who could, you know, go in or inspire or whatever. But now there's all this fear and mistrust and, you know, and, and it needs to change. I don't know how uh, that could happen, but, you know, what's going on now is not to me, protecting and serving. We're, we're so divided. I, I, don't, I don't even understand it, but I want to thank you for the work you're doing, the volunteers, and also thank you, too. Something needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if there are no other um, public comments, I'd like to close the section and open it up to the co-op members to make final comments. Uh, just one comment in response to Pat Adams. I'm not sure he's still here, but he was a, yes, Pat. You, you were addressing the question of, of targeting uh, by the police. Um, quite honestly, another example of the frustration I think the co-op feels is that we passed either eight or nine recommendations in October last year that specifically dealt with collectively what we titled bias-free policing, including uh, an appropriate policy which would prohibit racial profiling, really prohibit it, and a number of other specific steps to change um, the way that the Portland Police police to take out measures and, and approaches that we felt uh, ended up in racial disparities in terms of stops and arrests and so forth, and ultimately imprisonment. Um, we haven't heard from the DOJ, and we haven't heard from the city uh, or the police bureau in that time about uh, those important measures, and I share your frustration about that. And I, I think it's another example of what I alluded to earlier, and that is um, <laughs> sadly, uh, the lack of commitment that, I, that we, I think we feel by the police bureau and the, the leadership in the city to the work we're doing, to, to, to recommendations we're making to try and address issues such as you raised. Thank you. Are there any final comments from the co-op members before we close this section of the meeting? Okay, we'll close this section of the meeting. We'll take a 10 minute break and come back for a COAB discussion. We don't have a quorum of COAB members, so there won't be any voting, um, but the COAB members did want to meet so they could continue some of the discussions that we're having. So we'll reconvene at 7.35 for that. Thank you very much.
Okay, we're going to reconvene. Um, we originally were just going to have the town hall portion of the meeting, but members of the co-op expressed a desire to meet. Even though we don't have a quorum, um, I think there was a lot to discuss and people want to discuss it. So we'll get this started again. We have to close at 8.30, so um, I want to get going now so there is some time for discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll step back. I know that, that you guys had created an agenda um, and if you want to, I don't know if anybody wants to take the lead on that agenda and get started with the first item. <coughs> I, I can do that. Okay. So is, is V on the phone and is Maria still on the phone? They are watching via live stream. All right. Can they hear me? Hello. Um, to, to recap uh, some things that have happened recently and then to put in perspective um, at least one pending recommendation, which because we don't have a quorum we can't vote on, and then some other issues that um, need some discussion. And at the very least, um, I'm not sure how much we can actually get into the discussion, but we can at least announce the issues, and we would welcome uh, input, obviously, from the community as to um, ideas or solutions related to the, to the issues. Um, suffice it to say, there has been um, some discontent by the COAB with the um, COCO being the chair of the COAB, and that's required by the settlement agreement. Uh, likewise, the COCO has uh, expressed their discontent with being the chair of the COAB, so that COCO has sought a change in the settlement agreement so they would no longer chair the uh, COAB. Likewise, at our last meeting, the COAB passed a recommendation uh, to get rid of the COCO as the chair and allow us to select a chair from our own membership. We also passed at our last meeting a recommendation that the COCO should be replaced in whole or in part by a court appointed monitor with duties and responsibilities similar to those of court appointed monitors in Seattle and New Orleans, where similarly the DOJ has sued or did sue those um, jurisdictions over excessive force uh, in terms of a pattern of practice. The one formal recommendation that we did not get to at the last meeting has to do with um, whether or not the COAB should be um, entitled to independent legal counsel, the sense being that we aren't experts on what the law is as to um, public meetings law, uh, public records, um, the settlement agreement in terms of what it it may or may not mean, and that the advice we've received for a month, or a year and a half now has been from the city. And I think the sense is it has been, if not in conflict, at least um, uncomfortable for us at times and restrictive most of the times in terms of what we wanted to do. And so there's a feeling behind the recommendation that we get independent legal counsel. Um, the answers to the questions may be the same, but um, we don't know. And um, you know, having been a lawyer, and, and some of you may know too, d different people have different opinions about what the law is. It isn't, there's not just a set answer sometimes. There's uh, different uh, answers. And, and we just, there's a sense among some people in the COAB, and the reason for the recommendation that's going to be for the COAB eventually is that we have independent legal counsel. I want to introduce the other issues too, just so we get them sort of out as a um, as a base. And, and this is not an exhaustive list of issues. Um, it was put together by a group of three or four people with um, interest in trying to improve the operation of um, of the co-op. So I'll, I'm going to just kind of go through the issues quickly, um, and then I'm kind of up to whatever people want to do to how, how we then discuss any of this. And again, um, we are down, as I mentioned earlier, to eight 
uh, members of the collab out of 15, which is uh, a quorum, but we, I think, have five in attendance tonight, so we're not able to vote on anything. Um, and frankly, right now, I'm not sure whether we'll ever have a quorum again unless the city um, does something to fill the, the vacancies. But so some of the other issues, and they're in the, they're in the materials that were handed out. Um, what paid staff and funding does the COAB need to fulfill its responsibilities under the settlement agreement? And a couple of examples are we don't have research and development capacity. No one in the COCO or no one available to us can, can research or look into issues regarding training or uh, use of force um, policies. Um, there are people that can do that and we've done it as best we can, but that, that's an issue. Uh, likewise, an important function is community engagement, and there are people that have skills um, in community engagement, and I think we've done our best, but that th probably you know, is a position or, or at least uh, a commitment that we could use someone to help us with, and that's the thinking in terms of the issue. Uh, should members of the co-op receive stipends or at least receive reimbursement for mileage, parking, and bus expenses? Um, we're all volunteers. Uh, some of us have uh, more or less difficulty in doing the work um, without some reimbursement, some stipend. And I would point out that the formal, former chair, uh, Kathleen Sadat, issued an exit report in which she also identified that issue that some members of the co-op um, depending upon their financial situation, should probably receive a stipend. Um, should the COCO, excuse me, what should be the criteria and process for selecting and appointing individuals to the collab? The process was set up through the city and the DOJ and, and the community and, and is in the settlement agreement. You know, there are five community members at large there are five from the city's human rights, equity, disability offices. I, I don't have the titles right. And then there are five uh, appointed by the city commissioners. Um, currently, there are four vacancies uh, by the city commissioners for the appointees who retired and haven't been replaced. I think there's one community person at large, and I think there's two from equity and, and disability in the city. I'm not, I'm, the numbers may be off slightly. I think there's a question about whether that's the proper makeup of the co-op. I don't know the answer to that, but I mean, there's been some thinking about that. And there certainly is a question about why we have seven vacancies and we're at the point where we can't field a quorum to uh, conduct business. Um, and the co-op doesn't have the ability to fill those vacancies. Um, another question which is a little more internal uh, but it's been an issue is what should the criteria and process be for selecting and appointing individuals to the executive committee? Uh, should there be a term limit on membership on the executive committee? Currently the executive committee um, is set up under the bylaws for five members. Uh, three would be required for a quorum. Right now, we only have two, so there's no quorum on the executive committee to, to vote. There's an, a related question is whether the current restriction on membership on only two subcommittees is the right restriction. Um, as a practical matter, what's tended to happen is that the way that the executive committee is staffed with membership, um, a number of people that are involved in subcommittee work who can only be on two subcommittees can't then be on the executive committee and as a result there's been some feeling that the COCO as the chair has um, had too much say um, in what the COAB can do in terms of agendas and meetings and times and so forth. So there's a question about what the executive committee should look like, and that's more of a bylaw issue um, 
most of these issues or many of these issues require changes to the settlement agreement. Um, those are some issues that you know we've identified and there may well be others and some of you outside or inside <laughs> may have other ideas. And I don't know how we want to go about addressing any of this because we can't vote, but I just throw it out there. So. Any public comment? And, and, and please, please, please um, address them to either these issues or other issues related to the settlement agreement, the COCO, the COAB, as opposed to substance of the work we're doing rather than use of force or mental health crisis, kind of stay on topic. As people come up for public comment, I know we have limited time do you want me to track three minutes or? I, I'm, yeah, I think I we're. I think we're going to be fine. So, okay. Yeah. I, I just want to. You can track. That'd be good. Be respectful of yeah. the fact that there's a lot to talk about. Again, for the uh, record, my name is uh, Joe Walsh, and I represent Individuals for Justice. We would support the stipend. We've have we talked about that over a year ago. It is amazing to us that we have volunteers and then we have paid staff on the same committee. Think about this. The police department, when they attend the committees, are paid. You're paid either overtime or on comp time. I haven't looked at their contract, but being an ex-chief union steward, I would negotiate that they get time and a half. So they're being paid. The chairperson is well paid. So our concern is that you have two or three tier system of people on the same committee. Some getting paid, some not getting paid, which is always unfair. On Just on the basis, it's unfair. So we would argue that you should be at least reimbursed for any expenses. They can do it in the stipend. When I was in experience corps, we got like $200 a month, and we were still considered volunteers. We were under AmeriCorps, and we were considered volunteers. So I don't think you're going to lose your volunteer status because you're getting a stipend. The other thing that, that we're interested in is that we want you to understand that we really want you to succeed. We really do. We give you a hard time and we come and, and we get angry with you sometimes but we want you to succeed, and we do appreciate all the stuff that you've done. But picture this. Picture that animal that runs around in that wheel. Runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. They don't go anywhere. Just runs. Is that animal putting a lot of effort into it? Hell yeah. That poor animal is running like crazy. Turn him loose. Let him run in the woods. And watch what happens. Creativity is all, almost instantaneous when you let that animal loose. Don't keep him in that little box. And that's what you're doing here. You guys are working your asses off. Excuse my language. I may be wrong on this, but it seems to me that you guys submitted 50 recommendations to the city. You got a response from one. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay, that's our anger. That's where our anger is. It's not at you, and it's not at you. It's at the city. They're the perpetrators in this. They should have no involvement in this at all. None. They should get the bill because they screwed up. They should pay the bill because they screwed up. They're the perpetrators. They should have nothing to say on this committee. So, we want you to get your stipend, we want you to be able to select your chairperson, and if you do get that authority under the COAB, please extend it to the, the community at large. Don't do it on your own. Have somebody that you select, or three people that you select, and let the community decide. And that way when we come here, you can say, well, Joe, you said, Jane was terrific, and now you're whining about it. 
give us the opportunity to look foolish. Thank you. I have really bad cameras because I'm really poor. <laughs> So I have to, it won't focus, now it's better. Um, so basically, um, approachability, I wish I had a pen because I need to write down all the things in my mind because I'm so wired from the nice coffee. Thank you for the coffee. But um, I, I want to talk about approachability because I think, uh, like I agree with everything he said, including the stipend information, but um, if we're having trouble with the police feeling like we're approachable, like for instance, on Alison Waltz says, please report on me. She called me a co-ab disruptor, even though I live in Astoria. I'm not a co-ab, I'm not here to disrupt anything. I'm here to bring peace and light and hope and maybe I want you to go vegetarian or do yoga or something, but I'm not here to disrupt anything. I most certainly would never brandish a weapon at City Hall, and if you ask me to help do a national security training exercise, I'd be thrilled. I am so into law enforcement and law. I just am such a geek. I read about it all the time. I love it. And I feel like approachability is where we all start to realize we're human beings, we're not superheroes. Amy Watson is a human being. Laura Vanderlyn is a human being. They're both beautiful people, in my opinion, but one of them left here in a handcuffs and was put in an immigration detention type scenario despite the fact that she's lived in the States for 30 years. Total harassment that's sort of racist, prejudicial, maybe offensive to people like me who used to live in LA, which is like a sort of a, a, a safe haven <coughs> for people. Um, I think uh, approachability would mean like when I see an officer now, my response for an officer is to go shake their hand, tell them, hi, I'm Mary Ang. And I want them to know who I am because I may be blogging. I may disagree with something I said two years ago and I may be evolving. But if we don't have the simple respect of human to human respect, um, we won't be able to make any progress, no matter how complicated, intricate, streamlined our organizations are. And so I think the econo in the economic divide, if the COAB was the Indian caste system, I would be in the delete. I have to struggle and scramble and go to food banks. I don't live a life of luxury but I live a life of passion because for me, this is exciting. I've been following you guys from a distance. I do have internet. So I'm, I'm following what's going on and I was so deeply moved and concerned by the anxiety that I felt in these meetings that I felt I changed my life. I almost got killed by my, you know, I could call him my client, but he was the love of my life who tried to kill me. And I have a, like such a paper trail that if anyone ever wants to help me organize it, I don't know if it's a lawsuit, a book, a movie, it could be anything, but to me, it might be a training opportunity. And I just called Dinah Brooks at Behavioral Health Unit and I said, I wanna speak and volunteer and she's cool with that. And she's really happy I'm alive. And I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight, thank you. Uh, good evening again. I'm Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch, and um, uh, I, th uh, I think we've su supported the idea of stipends for a very long time for your board. And I understand there's people that don't think they need it. I think that's fine. They can they can refuse to take it if they want to. I think it should be offered. Um, I, I don't know if childcare was left off the list of things to be reimbursed for because sometimes this um, city provides it, but it probably should be on the list. Um, uh, the executive committee, uh, I was looking at the bylaws the other day and I, I know that somebody designed the executive committee to have one member from each of the five ways you can be appointed to this board. And the reason there's only two members now is because there's four city council members who aren't on and Dr. Silver, who's the last remaining one, is already on two subcommittees so she can't move up to the executive committee. And, but I don't <coughs> believe that that makeup of the board is actually written down in the bylaws. I think that was just like a policy that was adopted at some point. So that means that any of the other members of the COAB should be able to be appointed to the executive committee immediately so that that committee can function, in my opinion, um, because the, there's nothing restricting who the system there, except that 
restriction that you can only sit on two subcommittees. And we uh, objected to that at the time. There are members of the committee, and um, some of them are people who didn't have as much time to devote as other people, and they were worried that there would be in inequities created by people sitting on more than two subcommittees. I think now that there's only eight of you, that's kind of our warning has come to fruition. But I think to respect the concerns of those people, you should make a, um, and this is a formal recommendation that you can take up when you have a quorum, you should modify the bylaws, which only takes a, a majority of this group. It doesn't take a, a, a um, full eight people. It only needs to, takes a majority of a quorum, so five out of eight. Um, so that you, the restriction on sitting on only two committees is only in effect when there are ten or more, uh, more than ten members of the COAB seated, right? So that when there's ten or, few or fewer, that you can sit on more than two committees, and I think that will take care of your problem. Um, we also suggested, and I would continue to suggest, the executive committee be made up of the chairs of the subcommittees rather than who appointed them, because that makes more sense in terms of functioning. Uh, having a good functioning organization. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important is that I, you know, with the divorce papers being filed by both sides, um, I think there's a lot of people who feel like everything's in disarray and confusion and turmoil and who would want to join the group right now. So maybe they're, you know, I'm hearing there's some people are saying who, who, who would want to sit on the board right now. But I think the point is you still have work to do. You're still trying to do your work and you should <coughs> encourage the city to appoint people to fill those seats. I tell them that they can come and sit and work with you in the same manner that's been working all along. And if changes are going to be made, that's not going to happen until after October when the judge hears from the DOJ anyway. So I, you, you, COAB members, you have to reflect to the city that there's work that you want to do and you need those people appointed now. Thank you. Hi, Ann Casper again, and uh, I just want to say thank you so much, all of you and all of you also, wherever you are, I can't see you, um, for your time and your effort. It's been an incredible, incredible amount of work you've done. It's been an incredible amount of social community work you've done in this area. I've only stopped by here and there to come visit the committee and watch you, and it seems you've handled very, very tough issues in Portland that need to be handled. And I, as a citizen here, really appreciate that. So thank you so much for your work. I don't know who made the uh, structure of this committees or this work. Um, I don't think they've been on many public committees before because it's really tough. So I'm very happy that you're looking at the structure and changing it. Let's make it more humane so it's easier for other people to come in and that they want to come in. And um, something that I have learned through my committees, maybe this is going to sound very odd, things have to be a little bit of fun. And if it's not fun, why would I join it? What you're doing, your work is very, very, very important. But if it's just all serious all the time and very deep and it's very tough issues, it's very hard to handle. So again, I just want to thank all of you for your work, and I commend you on coming up with new solutions on looking at doing this differently. Um, and what I can do, I offer my support to hopefully find some new members and do what I can do. Thank you. I'm offering that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a comment in response to Dan's testimony or public comment and that, and thank you so much for that comment. Um, I've been coming to COAB since it was established. I've missed one meeting in this whole time I've been on. I've done all the reading and done a lot of work, been involved in the discussions. And right now, um, as a new chair of the executive committee, I've contacted the DOJ and said that we are really lacking in members, that we, we are unable to do our work. I haven't heard anything back. I know they're aware of the issues, but um, I'm really pushing for a response on that about, about this problem. And for, it's not only the executive committee on co-op, it's the subcommittees too. We're really, really just starving for members right now. We're not being able to get a lot done. And things are really going a bit off, um, off track. 
So I think it is important to disengage from COCOL and make some changes to our systems and so that we can really be more effective in that and get back on track to where we are really moving forward. And I mean, this COAB is important. I mean, all around the U.S. is depending on this. If this fails, more people are going to die from police shootings. How many more people need to die? This is serious. So that's why I'm really impassioned. I'm really supportive of police for reform. And I feel like I, I don't have the commitment from the PPB. Um, a lot less people are coming because they're too busy or what may have you. Um, and the partnership with Kogel has been disintegrating. So that's, yeah. So I really just appreciate your support and we're trying our best to keep on going. Um, and you see the issues here that we face. And of course, the bylaws do need to be altered as well. Once the bylaws are changed, we can do our work more effectively. But we need a vote to vote on the bylaws, and we don't have the members for that vote. So it's, that's, that's my comment. We have a comment from V. OK. Uh, so V writes, in terms of the balance of powers and for the COAB to c truly conduct its work, currently the COAB has the issue of available person hours available. Given the current conditions, I suggest the executive committee immediately use the current executive committee structure to suggest a member from the HRC or PCOD and or PCOD bucket fill the available chair on the executive committee so we can move forward with this important work. I know Catherine Gardner and myself are available for this particular position. Further, I suggest the executive committee start a small work group to engage the original selection committee so the community can help the city help fill or uh, help the co-ed fill seats at minimum. Oh, just in response to V's comment, I want the community to be aware of what's happening within PCOD and HRC. Both of them are really um, still under construction. There's been a lot of changes within both of those organizations. They're um, developing new structure, and a lot of the old timers have left. So there's a big influx of new people. So to appoint a person here, it's going to be challenging. Um, and I just want to put that out there as a heads up. <clears throat> I'm Karen Kastner. This is the first I've had to do with any of this, so it, this is based on what I've seen tonight. Uh, I'm an upset resident at this point. I'm unbelievably impressed with COAB. Your questions were to the point. You're working hard. You're I don't believe getting it nowhere has anything to do with you. I think there's obstructionism. One of the things I've learned through my profession has been if you don't have someone's attention, you aren't going to get anywhere. They don't even listen. So this is in no way meant as a put down on COAB. This is simply an outside opinion about how to get the attention you need to get the support you need. Have your entire committee resign. That is all I can see that will get people who have the authority to support you to realize there is a problem big enough they actually have to deal with it. Maybe that's big enough to get the feds to be involved again enough to give you the support you need. So I mean all of that in great support. I am unbelievably impressed with you. I am not impressed with COCL, CO, whatever, the other group, COCL. <clears throat> One thing you say is data, 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 data. The next thing you say is, well, everybody on the force knows who the bad cops are. But there's no, that's like, there, you don't need a bunch of data to know who the, what needs to be done. You need to do it. And what I see is obstructionism instead. Either the police and the mayor don't care, not involved, or obstructionism, we need more data. We don't need more data. We need more action. There are things that are completely self-evident that you said yourselves, and yet you want more data. 
Data is swell, but it's not the answer. Reality is the answer. I see this group as reality, and I see you as income producing. I just looked up on the phone, and it may be right or wrong, because you know, just like the press can be all wrong. 270K annually for your services, with 75K more per year for travel expenses. You could have your lawyer for that, your independent lawyer. You could have a lot of things, like support. I mean, I do you know, 30. I think you're sincere in what you're doing, but what I saw tonight is basic obstructionism and lack of interest by the people in the city, like the mayor and the, the past police who have, who have had the authority to help. And I'm sad about that. I have hope for the new police chief, but who knows? I've been in Portland since 56, and I've seen a lot of changes. So who knows? But good luck, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. I don't care. It's fine. One comment I would have is a, a number of years ago, it did not involve me, but the uh, Citizen Review Committee um, was so frustrated with, I may be phrasing this incorrectly, but so frustrated with the level of support and their ability to do work in terms of um, informing the public about the police and making recommendations and so forth that they they chose that um, approach and they they resigned in mass and again my understanding is all that resulted was they just found more people exactly. that it didn't really result in changes that the the city uh, didn't really respond to the sort of the merits of of why people resigned in mass and I can tell you that there's been some discussion of that happening with the co-op res uh, resignation in mass, and there's a question about whether, you know, that's the effective way to go. I, I, I think it's it's an issue. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, sorry, I'm ready. Um, Katie Hool again. Um, I guess the, I, the overwhelming, I guess, resounding theme I'm hearing is lack of solid leadership from top down. I mean, it really seems like that kind of is the overarching theme. And I mean, yeah, I can see how if you don't have the right people in place and you don't have buy-in, I mean, this is a very difficult thing even in the best of circumstances to do, but it's like, yeah, if you don't have buy-in in that, it's like, I don't even know how you would. And yeah, I mean, as far as the new ch police chief, you know, I remember the CRC hearing with that attorney who worked for the public defenders in Marion County who was like, just having a police contact, even if nothing else happens, could have gotten her fired from a job, just no questions asked. And then, you know, when we have a case where there are allegations and evidence of child abuse and things and nothing is really done, it does kind of make me worry about the leadership and just how seriously child abuse and domestic violence and other, other things are taken. On child abuse? Um, well, on. <laughs> I mean, what are the parameters, Tommy? Could, well, could you kind of keep it on topic at, on terms of us functioning and trying to yeah. survive? And I mean, let's. Okay, I ran into. Uh, I believe it's Sonora from BHU, correct me if I'm wrong. And she said they're doing trauma-informed care, and I've got a textbook on it, and I don't quite get it or know what it is. But I think one thing we have to really process is that because we're human beings, we've all gone through trauma. And I could say my trauma is more than yours or yours or yours, but we are all humans suffering different things, losses of parents or deaths or friends that died in car accidents. <clears throat> drug problems, marital problems, relationship problems. And I think in a way, if we as human beings experience those traumas in a compassionate way, we're not going to be in that us and them situation. I think the financial inequalities within the COAB structure, like I said, oh yeah, make, make COAB f a fair trade. I think every human being should have a living wage and somewhere to live and a right to work and health and safety. That's just what, I'm kind of Norwegian, Swedish about that. So that without, 
What I mean to say, though, is I'm a strangulation victim. I was raped in 2002 in Nashville, Tennessee. When I, my screaming reflex kicked in, it just saved my life in, in 2016. But when my screaming reflex kicked in in 20, 2002, that became the signal for my rapist to start choking me. So I just happened to be on the floor on my knees where I was at that point, and um, I started blackout, started to die, started to see stars. And um, this recent neck breaking that I experienced from this um, police, uh, I, I'm gonna say police brutality victim, who um, I, I've just had a nice personal chat with Carl Clint, but Carl Clint up there was, um, had detained this young man. He displays symptoms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And I've asked Bennett Amala to come and talk about it, the famed neurologist, because I feel like brain injury training is going to help us deal with people like him, and I don't want to assign the blame maybe the way I did a few years ago, because now I am Ben's victim in a very severe and painful way as I speak to you. My, my neck, my trachea, everything's messed up. So um, just so you know, the whole uh, protocol of, oh, we're in compliance, that's a lie, that is a whitewash, it's a misunderstanding, because when I, as this sort of like pro bono good Samaritan was trying to both fall in love with Ben and rescue him and be his paralegal and get him to court, I wasn't given victims assistance, I wasn't. Um, I, I think some, um, I can't speak for him per se, but they, they can't speak for themselves, they're not, they're not here, 10 of them resigned, but I think some of that resignation was maybe the workload and some of it was probably because, well, we're not here to rubber stamp anything. We're here to look through it, work through it, and talk with the, work with the community, the, we are the community, we all work together to figure out how do we get it right. But we're not here to rubber stamp. And when some board members started realizing that this is a rubber stamp program, they left. That's my take on it. Because I was one of those persons ready to leave. But then I am committed to police reform, and so I would not be resigning. I won't resign and kick me off the thing or whatever. But I will still be reported, uh, committed to police reform. And I think uh, you, you mentioned the time about the, uh, one, one of the board resigned, mass resignation. You know, a lot of people get masked. Was it mass incarceration, or mass resignation, or mass, a, dare I say shootings or whatever? We all get that, and that really doesn't solve anything. I think we need to hang in there and kind of figure out ways to get things right, get things back on track again. And, go, and you know, and that, that's, that includes all of us, because we are all in this together. So that, we just got to stay here. And that's it. Thank you. We have a comment from V. Yeah, V sent an email that she asked me to relate to the community in a response to Philip um, regarding executive committee membership. She writes, my point is for the executive committee to suggest a person from the current COAB um, HRC PCOD bucket, um, either Catherine Gardner or me, to become a member of the executive committee so that the executive committee has the quorum necessary to start making the changes COAB members and the public community members have expressed this evening. Okay. I'm not wedded to the idea of being on the executive committee. Um, I am, however, wed to continuing the work of the co-op in a supportive environment. So I'm wondering, uh, with the co-op, Jimmy and Tom, I'm wondering if there will be a temporary resolution that we could have um, sort of a temporary uh, hiatus until we can fix the structure and uh, until we can get more membership and again be ready to uh, conduct our work. Do you think that would be a possibility, a temporary resolution? I just put that out there on the table. I'm going to Tom take that. Well, I, I'm, I'm personally against it. I just think the city um, needs to step up and fulfill its responsibilities and there's, uh, there's no excuse for it I, I, unless they just want us to fail and I think um, you know, although I made the comment about uh, the CRC having chosen to resign in mass to try and affect the system, and it didn't work, and I think a suspension is um, also an approach that is, I think, a disservice. I think that it's just inexcusable that the city is not fulfilling its responsibilities. I'll give you another example. The settlement agreement says that the chief of police, the police commissioner, and, and some other people in the city are to meet with the COAB 
twice yearly. We are now 18 months into this process. They haven't met with us once. And um, they're, they have excuses. The Colco's given sure. us excuses. Uh, we can't set that meeting up, and they're not meeting with us. And if they want us to fail, then um, they're doing a good job of it because we, don't, we can't even get a quorum. But I don't think you know, going into hiatus is, does anything but serve their purpose, maybe. I just think that we need to stay here <laughs> and yeah. do our best with the membership we have, and they need to fill those vacancies. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Okay. I, I agree with you, Tom. I agree to 100%. I mean, you know, we, 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 we're we in it to really get this reform done, but, you know, there's some infighting going on, and we're fighting one another, and if we're talking about going on a, a temporary hiatus. We, we can't do that, not in, the middle, not in the middle of the round. I mean, Bill, Bill hasn't been rang yet. We, we just, <laughs> yeah. So we, 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 we... I just wanted to get the, the pe point. people's idea on that specific uh, thing that I was thinking about, so thanks for sharing. Yeah, I'm here. I'm good. Yeah. We've we've got five minutes. Yeah, we, we yeah. have. Go for it. Time yeah. left. Yeah, my. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Katie, again, my thing is I agree with Tom, and the other thing is there are court dates and other things in October that aren't going to change because <laughs> you take a hiatus. So I think, if anything, that's just going to add more stress because you're going to have the same amount of stuff to do in, like, maybe half the time. So, yeah, not – I mean, there are so many other things going on that I don't think that would, like, help anyone, and it would just add more stress. Um, in, in terms, I want to respond to what Steenson is saying. I feel like the, um, yeah, the city is having trouble right now. And a part of it is they're viewing good, honest citizen volunteers who are passionate about issues as a problem. They're snowballing COAB into fictitious complaints, alleging I was present at a Marshman swearing in. And I have witnesses to prove that I was actually in Astoria, Oregon. They're suggesting that our citizen participate. I grew up in Tennessee, which is called the volunteer state. And I'm all for unpaid internship lawsuit.com. I think interns, uh, like I'm a, I want to abolish the free market uh, racket that preferences trust fund kids who can afford to work 25 internships before they finally get really paid. I don't like the exploitation of our labor because I worked possibly nine hours on the internet last night, uploading my videos, coding things, um, doing work on the resign, the Charlie Hales resign campaign. And I think the obstructionism, my theory is I can still break in. I'm still an optimist. I think I can break the ice. I think I can bring human grace into the situation and that we can overcome these hurdles. But it's sort of like, if you've ever been on a lot of turbulence on an airplane, where you're just really focusing your mind on trying to help the pilot steer the plane, I feel like we're going through this turbulence and we need to realize we're in trauma from the O'Day shooting. We're in trauma from the Paris attacks. We're in trauma from our own lives, whatever happened in our own lives. And when we give of our time, give of our energy and ideas. Orlando shooting. Yeah, we don't expect to be arrested, have criminal complaints, have wrist injuries? I went to paralegal school. My professor, Vargas, he was very keen on perfect, honorable conduct at all times, never lying, never getting a DUI. I, like For me, Charlie Hales, by getting the G4S security guard to lie on a police report, or the police lying and then getting co covering or the dispatcher covering whoever told the lie that i had a corkscrew hopefully it was a m an honest mistake they've essentially tried to criminalize my participation in Wait, this in like time left in yeah. oh i'm sorry no absolutely forgive me yeah. can i say something i want to make it uh, make a comment to open it up to wrap up to wrap it up okay we have one more yeah, we, he, gentleman he, he, from public comment yeah. Question, I don't see why the hell you can't sue them. <laughs> you know? I mean, the trouble with doing that is court legal processes, it takes a while. But I think they ought to sue, sue them. The other thing is, what, whatever you want for alternatives, go for it. <laughs> Lay it out. Thank you. Thank you.
in the year 2010, six persons, six citizens were shot to death. Excuse me, five were shot to death, one survived. Of all those six persons, each and every one of them was in a crisis at the time, and the citizens did not receive the help that they should have received and instead were killed. Of those citizens, two were black, and of those black men, both had their hands raised in the sur international surrender sign, and they were killed anyway. We were talking about a traumatized community. Just one year alone, 2010, is a huge trauma from which we have not recovered and which we cannot get people to pay attention and listen and heed and act. We, I'm, I'm actually a researcher. I'm not really an activist. And my research is different from yours because I don't do statistics. What I do is documents and find out what really happened by reading documents. So the research projects that I did, I turned over to the city um, and they did nothing. So then I went to the DOJ and they did an ind independent investigation and they discovered that what I was saying was true. In addition to that, I had some strong questions about TASER. They investigated that, and they found that that, that was also true. So time goes by, and here we are. We're supposed to be solving some human problems, not just charting them and making some more paper on this. I have just come from a meeting at City Hall. And while we were all busy with this stuff, they came up with the idea that they want to privatize the, uh, the review of police misconduct and close those hearings to the public. So when the citizens get upset and distressed because they think the game is rigged, there are reasons we're not completely out of our minds. We are very distressed. I have a really serious hard time believing in anything going on here in the city uh, when there's an official doing the business. What I really want to say to all the citizens in this room is that what I told you about the year 2010 also is about human rights violations. And that's where I think the city of Portland should be going, to the United Nations, with these human rights violations. I think we might get people to listen to us there if we can't get people to listen to us here. I'd, li I'd like to respectfully ask that you consider the possibility that we might actually have a good case. Thank you. So we're coming up on 8.30. I don't know if there's any final comments from the COAB members before we close the meeting. Just for the record, I'm speaking for myself. And maybe some COAB members might agree with me, maybe not. But I just want to say that I'm making a request for the COCOL to recognize us and our issues and our concerns related to their behavior as per what we've seen. The petition, it's just a very, it's full of accusation, accusations against the COAB and no way to resolve these issues. And so I don't really see a way to resolve these issues and build trust with the, the COCOL. I feel like they've hurt our trust and cost the community a lot of money and time and the city a lot of time and money and ruined a lot of the work that we've tried to do. So I'm asking the community to recognize this and help us and try to fix this problem, to have full membership and to proceed with our work. And since the COCOL is not following the settlement agreement, they've broken a few, uh, they've had a few violations, I'm asking them, the community, to respond and recognize this and to do something about it. 
and that's that's all I want to say and uh, as far as wrapping everything up okay well given that we don't have a quorum we probably won't do a vote for closing the meeting at this point we'll, we'll close the meeting um, the next scheduled co-ed meeting is August 11th and we should have all the materials that were passed out here available on the website as well so if people have questions so thank you everyone Thank you.